Good morning. I apologize for my tardiness, um, but I'm glad we're able to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our November 13th State Board meeting. We would, let's, let's have just a moment of silence <laughs> and um, just center our thoughts in our heart. Have any changes to the agenda? Okay. Any new business? All right. Then we'll get started with the reports, starting with uh, Dalloway presentation. And Stacy Smith. Good morning, Stacy Smith, Director of OCSS, um, and Dan's going to pull up the presentation for us, I believe. Um, First off, I just want to thank you for dedicating this morning um, for the discussion of Dollar Way. I think it's important that we really just kind of carve time out to really go over everything and all of the information. There's been a lot of work that's been done in the Dollar Way School District the past five years. Um, if you have not met Miss Barbara Warren, um, she is the superintendent of Dollar Way and Pine Bluff School District, and we're happy to have her with us today. And with her is Dee Davis, who is also with Dollar Way. She does a lot of the curriculum work, works very closely with our team, um, and so welcome, we're glad you're here as well. Um, thank you, Dan, for pulling that up. So, a lot of information, a lot of slides to go over today. Um, I did provide, and we're not to this yet, but you do kind of have a note-taking document that kind of follows the um, presentation today. There's no information in it, it's just boxes, but it's a place for you to take notes, and, and I'll kind of key, um, key you in to when that document piece starts, okay? So, one of the first things when I went to Commissioner Key with the presentation and you know asked him was there anything missing and he said, vision and mission. And it's always great to come back and center ourselves around that. And when I was going through the slides, I don't know, I'm not sure why, but I really stopped and read the vision and mission again, thinking about how that plays into context with what we're doing um, with our schools. Um, and so, wore my student focus pen today, so Ms. Zook, if she's watching, she can know that, that everything that we're doing <coughs> with the discussion today around Dollar Way is about students, okay, um, and making decisions for them. And then when I looked at the mission part um, about the department providing leadership, support, and service, I hope that that's what our team, OCCSS, is doing for the Dollar Way School Districts when we go in and we support and feel like partners when we're doing this work. And I also feel like we've brought in our comprehensive center. We've got West Ed here today. Jason's with us, and I'll introduce him in just a second. But that same vision part is, are we all working to the same thing? And the outcome is we want students to graduate, and we want them to graduate prepared for college, career, um, and community engagement. And so all those pieces today, as we're going through this presentation, they're weaved in throughout the entire thing. And so I felt like the project itself really stayed um, true to what our mission and vision is for the department. Um, so our comprehensive center, I've talked to you about this a couple of times, that I wanted to bring in um, a third party that was neutral to, to take a look at everything that's been done in Dollar Way, to take a look at our work, to help guide and give guidance. And so there are many people that have worked on this project. And in person, I think this is our first time that you've gotten to fly since March, right? Um, we've got Jason Willis with us from West Ed. Um, on Zoom, we have Lauren Outlaw with us, and we have Felicia Reed and Camilla Wilson. Um, everybody, and Paul Kohler is not on the Zoom today, but he's also been an integral part of this project. And so Jason will be actually be presenting to you in a minute. Um, this presentation is in two parts. My part is this long, so we're going to go through it pretty quick, okay? Um, and then Jason gets this, all right? 
So Jason's got the meat of it today. And so really a lot of my part is background and I am gonna touch on the slides and try to go through them pretty quickly because I feel like Jason's part is really kind of digs down into some of the details, all right? So just kind of the overview of how we're hitting this today. Gonna give you a little bit of the background, a little bit of context towards Dollar Way. Going to kind of walk you through your decision as a board, the decision that you have to make and the options that you have. I'm going to go over the exit criteria and talk about the, quanti the quantitative and qualitative outlook on that. Um, Jason's gonna get into the research methods that they used um, in laying out the different options, um, the execution strategies for the different scenarios, the findings, and our next step as, as uh, agency and a board where to go. Um, I, w I do want to say, when we get into the different scenarios, we, we, we gave scenarios for every option that's there, all right? Whether it's going back to local control, whether it's annexation, whether it's consolidation, we, we laid out lots of different options. It's not set in stone. Everything is flexible. We just really wanted to try to pave and make some connections for you. So as you go through the next couple of weeks and try to make some decisions, you have something to grab onto, okay? So everybody knows that Dollar Way is in Jefferson County, okay? And so that is just northwest of Pine Bluff. Um, this year's student enrollment is around 920 students. Um, when you're looking at the map, and, and we went over in detail the maps recently um, in, 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 in that discussion about the Alzheimer's campus and the industry park, the park and industrial park and all those pieces. So not a lot has changed there. Um, this map right here shows the population and the boundaries in the school districts. Um, earlier, I had Jason, I said, okay, really sit down and talk to me about what, what is it I'm trying to see here? And if you look at the areas in red, those are the areas that are losing in population. Okay, and when you look at the areas in green, those are the areas in those counties that would be growing or had grown in those years. Jason, am I correct on that? So those are kind of your, your pieces to look at. And you can see that the population, especially like through Whitehall and even in some of the Pine Bluff areas, you are seeing some growth. When you're looking at this, you have some bar graphs that are attached to it. And this may be one you wanna go back and dig into a little bit deeper. But it's also, they're also kind of attached to the colors on the, the map itself. So specifically, when, they're hard for me to see. So when you're looking at the area that's that, that red, the brightest red area there, and you're looking at that bar chart, um, Jason and I were talking about this a second ago. That bar chart is grouped by age groups. Okay, so that orange is the older student group that's in high school, okay? And as you go down all the way to the bottom, the blue would be your incoming preschool, okay? So you can see in that area, there is not a high population in younger students, okay, or future growth. Whereas in the top end, so it's kind of connected to the red in that area about future growth for students in that, in that area or population. When you look in the green areas, it's kind of flipped a little bit. Um, so, uh, Jason, is there anything about that map you want to comment on? Come on up here. I did warn him I might throw him a softball <laughs> when I got to the maps. So here it is, Jason. So the, so the only thing that I would add to this this map here is that you know, as Mrs. Smith um, had explained, that. This looks at a subset of the population within Jefferson County that is looking at um, school-aged children. That gives you a sense of the trajectory of what future cohorts within the schools is gonna look like. Uh, and so as Mrs. Smith said, that those areas that are red or orange um, tend to have, you can project basically smaller cohorts of enrollment <clears throat> in those places of Jefferson County as opposed to other places, perhaps in Whitehall or Watson Chapel, you could, you could project some of that growth. You said that so much better than I did. In fact, if you want to take my part of this presentation, no? All right, so Jason's gonna go very deep into the financial part in a little while later, and this is, these are pieces that you've seen, but you can see the assessment value over time. Um, they've remained, in fact, they've shown a, a slight increase in the past few years, but they did have a significant drop um, back in 2015-16. When you're looking at their meals have, have remained steady, steady and their um, 
debt bond, non-bond balance, so that they're, they're keeping up with their, their payments and things like that. When you get to per pupil expenditures, Dan, can you move the picture part You're on the slides? When you're looking at the per pupil expenditure part there, um, it's about 16000 per student. And one thing I want to talk about is sometimes that per pupil expenditure part is a little deceiving because you're talking about all funding, whether it's federal funding, operating funding. You're also talking about their 1003B dollars. Um, all that's going into that per pupil piece. And so when it looks like there's been an increase, you've got some balancing going on here. You've got this loss of students. You've got these federal funds. And so, um, but their per pupil expenditure is 16000 um, you're looking at number of teachers, you're looking at their average salary is 48000 um, So those are some pieces there. When you're moving to this one, their educator workforce, you're looking at 37%. And, and this is one I kind of want to pause on for a second because you're, in the summary report that I submitted to you, there was a lot said about teacher workforce. And 37% of their teachers in their district are considered to be novice teachers. That means they have three years or less teaching experience, okay? So 12% 12, 12 of their teachers are on an emergency teaching permit. And so Ms. Warren and I were visiting about this just a second ago, and we looked at this 181 courses taught by a teacher with an emergency teaching permit. So courses. So a single teacher at a high school will teach seven courses because you have an eight-period day, correct? And so you have to think of it in terms of that. Um, 62 courses. Two courses are taught by an, a long-term substitute. So that gets really into special education. So they have a shortage area there. All of their long-term subs or teachers on emergency teaching permits are going through the pathways to become licensed in that areas. But there is a significant group of teachers in that area that are teaching courses that are out of their licensed area, okay? Um, enrollment, this is enrollment over time. So you can see the trend. Um, from 2016 to where they currently are. Um, this last year to this year, they've not a significant loss of students. Um, open and closed campuses within the Dollarway School District. So the red dots indicate school campuses that have closed um, in the past um, decade. Individual buildings in the Dollarway School District. And again, I know I'm kind of flying through this. There are three main buildings in Dollarway School, School District. So you have James Matthew Elementary. Um, enrollment at James Matthew is 340, and that's pre-K through fourth grade. They have 24 teachers in that school. You have Robert Moorhead Middle School. So 287 students at the middle school. Again, 24 teachers in that campus. And then at the high school, enrollment of 273, and you have 44 teachers on that campus. So previous state actions. So um, there was a consolidation in 2006 of the Alzheimer School District. Um, the Dollarway School District was in um, previous state authority due to standards for accreditation violations over several years. And so the viola violations that led them to state authority were in 2010, and in 2011. Um, in 2000, um, so the state board at that time did, it was called a reconstitution, but when you went back and looked at exactly what happened, it was the same thing that we've kind of done with state authority. Superintendent was removed, school board was removed, and they went under state authority for about two years. In 2014, they were returned back um, because there were no um, standards for accreditation violations in 2012 and 2013. Um, right prior, Right before Barbara ended up in Dollarway, the Altarma campus itself closed. Um, under state authority for this time in 2015, the district was placed under state authority for academic distress. In 2017 is when um, the accountability rules switched over to the level five support. So in that, that brought on the level five exit plan, the district support plan, and the quarterly reports to the state board. They were also classified in April 2016 for fiscal distress as a classification, and so that continued a fiscal distress plan and monitoring on fiscal services. So where are we today and, and what do the decisions that the state board um, has to make? 
So this kind of is a decision tree on elements that we're going to talk through today. So that first, the blue bar, is really about the decision around level five support. So, the, so I'm going to present exit criteria to you today, and I'm going to present the plan, I'm going to present how we monitored that, um, and we have to determine did they meet exit criteria or did they not, okay? If it is determined that they did not meet exit criteria, you can see that the, the law basically says that the state board must reconstitute, annex, or consolidate, okay? If it is found that they did meet exit criteria, um, then we've got you down to a second level there where we want to look at the fiscal criteria, the fiscal distress classification. Both the academic and the fiscal are in their fifth year. All right, so they, they really go hand in hand. So on both fronts in this presentation, we're going to be looking at both the fiscal and looking at the academic level five support. Um, under fiscal, if um, they did not meet exit criteria under fiscal, you can see the same thing. The state board must reconstitute, annex, or consolidate. Okay, only if they have met both level five exit criteria and fiscal criteria can they return to local control. All right, and so as we go through today's presentation, we'll actually have some slides that show different pieces of legislations and rules that we're following that kind of give that guidance. So kind of hitting on these four big buckets, the one of returning back to local control. So if that was a decision that was made, then Dollar Way would be governed by a locally elected or appointed school board. Reconstitution. Free constitution was decided, then that means the Dollar Way School District would be governed differently than they currently are in a manner that is set up by the state board. Um, annexation basically means that Dollar Way School District would become a part of another school district. And consolidation means that there's more than one or more other districts that come together to make a new district. Um, and for purposes today, and as West is talking, in the scenarios that we've talked about, a lot of conversation has centered around Dollaway and Palm Bluff. So this is a question that keeps coming up, and this is something we heard in stakeholder feedback too, is can Dollaway continue under state authority, under state control? Um, when you go back to the decision tree, the state board does not have the authority to keep a district under state control, under level five support. Okay, when it gets to five years, a decision has to be made. If they did not meet exit criteria, we, we are bound by law to make one of those decisions. Okay, so if it's found that they did make it, okay, then there goes to a fiscal piece, and I'm not going to drive us down that, that train right now because there's lots of if factors. Okay, but the main thing today is we're looking at the level five support and exit criteria there. Okay, so. You each have been given a discussion guide if you choose to use it. There's nothing in this guide that's not in the presentation, okay? Everything that's on here, the charts and everything are straight from the presentation. What it does do is it gives you boxes to take notes on. So if there's a question that you have, if something stands out, something you wanna make a note of, it kinda connects it for you. It's also color coded, okay? So earlier when we were looking at those, those four boxes here, um, throughout the different scenarios, you'll see it's color coded in here as well. All right, so it kind of pulls it all together for you. So let's talk about the, the main question here is, has Dollar Way met level um, five exit criteria uh, for, for the academics? And you did receive a summary report um, on the agenda that, that discussed the OCSS team going in and doing kind of a three-day monitoring of the team and actually giving a, a rubric scale and scoring whether or not the, how the district did on the different areas. And so while there was a three-day monitoring um, visit, um, scores were not solely based on those three days. It was based on going back and reviewing previous reports, um, interviews, um, previous knowledge of our staff in classrooms working with teachers. So minimal progress partially met to two, met with direct supports of three, and met with independence of four. You'll also notice that's the same kind of rubric that we've been using the last time I came with the OCSS report on monthly goals um, as we're setting goals up, okay? So 
This first indicator at the top talks about collaborative teams regularly interact to address common issues regarding curriculum, assessment, and instruction. And that's really that, that premise of um, professional learning communities and the work that they're doing there. Dollarway School District has um, invested greatly in this process and has done a lot of work around this area. And so when we look specific at the objectives there, we could see evidence um, that that was happening. If you'll notice on 1.3, they got a perfect school of a four. All the school teams um, do, do have schedules that allow for collaborative teams, and it's a priority within the district. Um, we, when we went in, we scored each individual building. So we went through each building, we went through every classroom, we interviewed lots of people. We zoomed into meetings that were collaborative team time meetings to see if that's really what the discussion was. And so the schools kind of ranged between a two to a three, and they were doing it with, with some you know, fidelity, and you know, others were consistent, it depended on the grade level. Okay, so we saw some inconsistency there. Indicator two, the school is aware and monitors predominant instructional practices. Um, so when you look specific at the objectives there, kind of hit mainly twos um, at the building there. While there is a lot of work around curriculum in the district and while the district is shifting and moving that direction, um, we're still not there as far as a, a fidelity with instructional practices or high quality instruction in um, all classrooms. Um, Ms. Warren and I um, had, had a lengthy discussion. Um, she's well aware of the strengths and the weaknesses um, and the need for that rise of more consistency um, and quality within classrooms and all classrooms for students. We definitely had some, some high spots and some, some great spots where things were going really, really well. And then we had areas that still needed a lot of additional support. Um, indicator three talks about the school provides teachers with clear ongoing evaluations um, of their strengths and weaknesses. And so we did see and we have seen some of their leadership capacity being built in using EdReflect tools, being able to give feedback and guidance, being intentional about monitoring classrooms. Um, when we were talking to teachers, we would ask them, does your principal come into your classroom? What type of feedback do you get back? And so we, we wanted to know. And so we were hearing, again, we saw some consistency in some places and other places some inconsistency. Um, indicator four, um, school curriculum um, adheres to district and state standards. So they're kind of, you know, some subject matters, yes, some subject matters we're still, we're still trying to get there. Um, when you ask teachers in the classrooms, do you have what you need to teach? The answer was yes. And I will say that the district has done an aggressive job this year to make sure that the school district had a um, learning management um, system platform that actually had content. And so that, that has been advantageous to the districts this year. Indica Indicator five talks about the financial support for teaching and learning within the district. Um, again, it was kind of, kind of hit or miss in that middle area. Um, overall scores is 2.5, so really right in the middle of that direct support, um, partially meeting to, to meeting. Overall, rating for exit criteria when you look at the score from a one to a four it averages out to a 2.64 so kind of just really hitting kind of right in the middle one thing i do want to note and this is something that that we felt was important is when we really wanted to go back to a 2.64 doesn't sound like we've done a whole lot okay but when you go back and you start interviewing what has the change that has occurred in the dollarway school district from the first year of takeover, um, when you've interviewed Barbara, when you interviewed the teachers and the staff, one thing that we heard over and over again was culture and climate. Um, feeling like a family, feeling like a community now. Um, you know, none of that is in this rubric to score because we're looking at the academic achievement, teaching and learning part of, uh, of the campus. But I would say, and, and I think you even heard this in some of the stakeholder feedback, they don't feel like they really got involved in trying to improve academics until year three. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, that year, year, year three, kind of starting to hit that area. First two years was really about addressing the climate, the culture of the buildings, setting up for a system that could be foundational to be able to, to move from there. And so I will say when you go through the Dollarway School District,
Thank you. So I'm going to pause right there. So that kind of hit the level five um, exit criteria for um, the academic piece. Does anybody have a question about those? Dr. Moore? Yes, thank you all for presenting and, and thank you all for being here today. I um, echo when I visited Dollar Way last year, um, really seeing PLCs in that culture in action was great. Um, I was ready to go teach at the elementary school, um, doing great work. Um, I, and I know we've had this conversation before, and I know that because of COVID, we, ha we did not have assessments in the fall. But is this, we are not considering any sort of student data or student inputs into this exit criteria, is that correct? On this exit criteria, we did not. Okay. Um, on the work day, I can be happy to bring to you any assessment that we had from the previous four years. Okay. I'm happy to bring to you their NWEA results um, but so is NWA, what you ACT Aspire interims and the Renaissance and Star. Okay, and that's what's has that been able to be go on, go on this school year for? They have they, ha they and they did provide the Renaissance Star. We didn't have a hundred percent of the students take it, but we do have a percentage of it, and we do have an assessment report for that that I can give to you. Okay, and have teachers been able to use that data effectively? Um. I think that'd be great to have at our work session because I, um, you know, I, I see these extra criteria as a list of inputs, which are great and very important, but when we don't have the output, you know, it, it's only as good as what you, yeah, we, you know, and I appreciate your team going sure. in to really look at all these, um, but we also want to hear about how students are how doing. Outputs. So, um, no, I, I agree with you. And one thing as far as the outputs go, and in just the monitoring, um, we did go back and look at their test results. And you did hear that over and over again, if we had one more year. Um, I will say, when you look at the number of students that they were, would have had to move, it's, it's significant to have met the exit criteria. Um, and I, I will bring that back to you. And it's in that, um, the quarterly reports as well. But the number of students that you had to move from in needs of support out of that box was a significant number of students. Um, in monitoring classroom expectation and rigor um, in all grade levels, um, it, it, they would have had a difficult time meeting. But we, but let me pull the reports for you to look at. Okay. Thank you. I mean, in saying that, knowing that test score is not the end all be all right. at all, it is just one, one factor um, as we look at how students are doing and where they are. Um, I think particularly if we can have any sort of data on reading levels at elementary mm -hmm. and middle school. Um, yeah, absolutely. We'd love to provide that for you. And, you know, when I say, you know, it's hard to stand up here and say they probably wouldn't have met it. Right. But the thing that keeps plaguing the district is the, the turnover of teachers and the mm -hmm. novice teachers. And so you get someone trained, you get them in salute, the, the professional learning communities, and then you have another group come in and you're starting again. And so they've had this, when you think about 32% of their st teachers being that novice group, it's kind of like they're constantly working against this, this, this piece of getting the rigor where it needs to be and starting over. Um, so can I point to many, many good things that were very supportive of teachers in the Dollar Way School District? Absolutely can. Can I stand before you today after visiting all the schools and, and interviewing lots of teachers and high school students and say, that the academics in every classroom in the school district is, is at a high level of where it needs to be. Um, it's, it's, it's not. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Not to say that the teachers are not committed, because they are. Not to say that Ms. Warren and Ms. Davis are not committed, because they are. Um, the, the strategies that are being used are good strategies. Um, we're just not there. Okay, moving to the fiscal distress classification. Um, on your sheet, on this one, they were placed into fiscal distress for two, for two reasons. One was for the declining balance for fiscal integrity, and the other was for the material audit findings, okay? And so within the fiscal distress plan, there was also many objectives. All right, but the two indicators are these two that have to be met to be placed out of 
are to be considered meeting, okay? So when you just look at indicator number one, the declining balance, you can see a chart here that shows that the Dollar Way School District has continued to have a declining ba balance um, from 2017 until 2000 um, and, and, and this current year. Without signi significant cuts um, going into next year, um, they would, I mean, they're already deficit spending, okay? So going into the next school year, they would have to make significant cuts um, to make their budget work. So as far as a declining balance that jeopardizes the fiscal integrity of the district, this is kind of the model that we're currently at. When you're looking at indicator number two, material audit findings, this is an area that we wanna brag on the district, we wanna brag on the business office, wanna brag on our OCSS team and the work that's been there when the district was first put in fiscal distress. This says 15, but I think there was actually 19 because you had supplemental that were not counted on this. Um, 19 findings. Um, this last year, it, from 17 it was zero, 18 it was two, um, 19 one. I think this last year they just finished the audit and I think we had one again. So um, this is an area that has been resolved. They do have practices in place. Um, they have set their, their, their procedures in place. So this is something that um, has been addressed. When you go through the fiscal distress exit criteria, what I asked our OCS office who works on finance to do is to use that same scale of one to four on these objectives for yearly to see, did we meet that, did we not meet that? And so you can kind of see on the objectives here, some of the ones that go with this idea of creating a, um, a managed business office and to control of those, those audit findings, those are the scores you're gonna score higher on. In areas where, um, you know, the money part, the staffing, are we where we need to be so that we're not ending in um, a declining balance or deficit spending, those are the scores you're gonna see a little bit lower, okay? So we have not reversed our deficit spending within the Dollarway School District, and our, our final balance does continue to decline. Stacy. Yes. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, regarding the audit, are they using uh, state audit or private firm? They're using the state. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, Dan, would you go back one more slide? There's just some information. Thank you. Yes, Which one? Thank you. This one? On your um, on the state board agenda you had two reports filed and one report is a summary report of our visit I believe it's seven pages with a summary and all of these scores are fleshed out on that as well so that might be an easier place for you later to go back and pull and kind of read about the, that visit you want a hard copy of the presentation or, no, just a soft copy is fine yes I'll, yeah okay. we'll get that you should have it on your agenda oh okay So level five um, extra criteria overall rating was a 2.64. Fiscal distress classification, again, you had those two indicators. So when you kind of put this on a scale and looking at it overall, um, I felt like we needed to kind of, kind of look at this visually. Um, where do we want our, the district to be um, at this time? We would really prefer the district as far as meeting extra criteria to kind of hit that higher end of the scale at 3.5 to four. Um, right now they're just kind of right there in the middle the fiscal is the purple the academic or level five support is the blue x so they were both hitting like a 2.64 and a 2.69 kind of right in that middle of direct support and meeting with direct support do you want to make a comment yes i would thank you uh, stacy um, and, and miss chambers I, I think you're on um just in case, I mean, do you give a little context to this, uh, the scale, uh, you know, members, I mean, Ms. Newton, you've asked several times, and uh, Ms. Chambers has asked a number of times, when we're dealing with state takeover uh, schools, you know, how do we know 
that we're meeting the exit criteria. And, and it's with academic uh, in the old, the way we looked at it with the academic distress, you know, it was very clear. You had one indicator, you had one score that you either made it or you didn't. But that didn't provide, you know, a lot of the context in, you know, let's say you never made it. It's really similar with, with A to F. You know, if, if the only criteria there were, uh, are you an F school still, then that um, that's important, but it, it's also um, not as complete when you're trying to, to describe what's going on there. And, you know, this started, um, kind of a concept with Dr. Hernandez was here about how do we look at the, but I really want to uh, say thanks to Stacy here because uh, she's worked to refine this and, and worked with Ms. Whitlow and Mr. Hoy and a number of the team of OCSS uh, to really develop something that we hope uh, as we deal with future districts, I uh, hope we never have to deal with this level of, uh, of takeover, but you know, let's be real. The law is there for a reason. Um, if we do, we want to have uh, developed a system that gives you all very, uh, very clear um, metrics for how are we doing and, and refining the way we set the, the uh, exit plans and how we measure those exit plans. So while you see this is here at the end of a, of a process, of a five-year process, what we hope is that in the future this is something that we can give you on a regular basis so you can see how they are growing with respect to minimal progress partially met met or met with independence and the met with independence as Stacy said that's where we want to get our schools to in these situations uh, so I just I just wanted to pause for a second and give kudos to Stacy and the team uh, for really putting together something that gives us a better visual of, uh, of are we winning, are we making progress? Thank you for those comments. Um, you know, I, again, I, it's, it's always interesting to, because I've sat in the audience and I've listened to other districts being presented and, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine line between, between being able to present the, what you really see and the facts um, in comparison to what you want it to be um, there are good things happening in the Dollarway School District, and there are good teachers in the Dollarway School District. Um, and these two ladies up here are phenomenal. Um, and they have, they have great leadership going on. They are making the right moves. Um, if, if we could have started year one on the academics as intense, I think maybe we'd be further along in the academics on progress for students. Um, but they, they did address climate and culture in their buildings and facilities and needs and made some different cho choices and decisions and really he elevated to what it means to be a staff member in the Dollarway School District. And so there, there has been progress made and there is right discussion and conversations on academics. There's just still a lot of growth to happen, okay? So with that, that's, that ends my part. So now you get Jason's part. Um, so Jason, is from California and I got to meet Jason last night for now I get to make fun of you so that that's the part about me you don't know so we met Jason for dinner last night and he thought I guess he was going to Antarctica shows up in a, a coat zipped up to here um, so welcome to Arkansas I don't think it was that cold last night I'm not even sure I had a coat on but I think he wore it for the entire dinner he did he had it on the entire dinner um, but from the from the get-go for this process um, you know, there are times that you're, you're, you're just blessed because the right people come in at the right time when you need help. And that is truly what um, I can say West Ed and West Ed have been with the Comprehensive Center, the right people at the right time. Um, top tier professionals ask the right questions, but at the same time, completely student focused. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've gone to, to Dr. Pfeffer or to Commissioner Key and to, to brag about the team and the work that they've done. So Jason's going to come up today, and he's going to present and walk you through all your different scenario options. Again, nothing is set in stone. This is the third party looking out to say, hey, if you decide to do this, here are some things to consider, um, and these are the reasons to consider those, all right? You do have your packet to take notes going through that also is color-coded that fits with the presentation. So with that, 
get to introduce today. Willis. Sorry, I made a new name for you. Uh, good morning. Um, I was quite an introduction, Stacy. Thank you. Uh, a lot to live up to in the next uh, couple of hours. Um, but uh, as Stacy mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Jason Willis. I am an area director for strategic resource implementation and planning with Westhead. Um, for short, uh, our team um, deals primarily with uh, matters of school finance uh, and system improvement at both the state and school district level. Uh, and Westhead as an agency um, uh, has been around for quite some time, uh, nearly 50 years, um, dealing with just about any issue uh, in K-12 education. Um, and in this circumstance, uh, we've come together uh, with the Region 14 Comprehensive Center, which is hosted by West Stat, um, another one of our partners uh, in this sector to support states, um, and in this case, Arkansas, with our work. So um, today, uh, you know, as um, Stacy had mentioned, um, I'm going to be going through uh, the various scenarios uh, that uh, Dollarway uh, may um, end up exercising um, through authorization of the state board uh, over the course of um, the next, uh, the coming months and years. Uh, today, uh, in addition to myself, um, I'm joined by Lauren Outlaw and Felicia Reed. Um, I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves. And I'm going to, in some ways, be maestroing uh, our conversation today uh, in order to kind of bring them into the conversation, um, but also move um, the, the state board through each of these four options that um, Stacy uh, had set up. So uh, to get started, um, I want to um, remind uh, the state board of uh, the decision tree that, that we discussed, so the first two levels of uh, the academic criteria for level five support and the consideration of fiscal distress criteria are the information that Stacy uh, or Mrs. Smith went over. Uh, and I'll be covering uh, that bottom uh, set of decisions around the four options, the return to local control, the reconstitution, the annexation, uh, or the consolidation. So to set up our conversation, uh, we think it's actually really important uh, to go over um, some of our research methods uh, and if we take a step back uh, in thinking about how we organized our um, independent and objective analysis uh, going into this work with the Arkansas Department of Ed and with, um, with Dollarway, uh, we really looked at this from the perspective of four, um, four uh, sources of information, if you will. Uh, the first includes consultation with the DASI staff, so that includes Mrs. Smith, as well as other staff um, from the department. Uh, we also uh, did a comprehensive financial and operational analysis, um, and we'll talk about that um, in more depth in a moment. Uh, we also looked at the scenario analysis itself, so analyzing both the legal and regulatory code in consultation with your counsel to the board, as well as the counsel to the, um, to the department. And finally, um, offering up an opportunity to engage directly the Dollar Way community uh, in gathering feedback from them about this decision that is coming before the board in a matter of a month or so, uh, in asking them about these various scenarios, how they have felt uh, about this, this work that the state has partnered with the district in doing. And all of that kind of leads to the centrality of, after each of the scenarios that we'll go through, um, an execution strategy for your consideration uh, as the State Board of Education. So once you make the decision, about any one of those four options, the execution strategies are considerations, some of which are mandated by law, others of which are things that we would um, offer for the state board to consider um, as a part of making that decision itself um, that would help to support the transition of Dollarway School District uh, through, that, through that scenario, or through that option, I'm sorry. So um, a couple of important things to note in terms of what was not included in the analysis, uh, the first of which is that uh, this impact analysis of both annexation and consolidation of Dollarway uh, with other Jefferson County school districts did not go beyond Pine Bluff. So for example, we did not look at uh, consideration of Whitehall or of Watson Chapel. We were really looking um, on the options of annexation and consolidation just uh, at the opportunity to um, to, to consolidate or annex 
uh, to Pine Bluff School District. Um, the second is that the implications analysis and use of CARES Act funding um, and those flexibilities of other one-time federal funds were excluded from the analysis, um, in part largely due to the fact that these were unique circumstances, hopefully not something that continually Dollarway or any other school district would, having, would, would be, have access to in the future as they're trying to obviously address the, the coronavirus pandemic at this point. And finally, that the fiscal and operational impact of um, suggestions raised during the stakeholder input sessions uh, were acknowledged, but they were not incorporated into the financial and operational analysis. We felt it was really important that we at WestEd, given our expertise and our background, had the ability to look at these issues from an independent and objective standpoint, and we'll talk about some of those assumptions um, as we progress forward. So um, I want to start with the um, scenario analysis, and I want to invite my colleague, uh, Lauren Outlaw. Uh, I think Lauren is with us um, to introduce herself and then jump in on the scenario analysis. Lauren, are you there? Yes. Yes, I am. Are you able to hear me? Yep. OK, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you to everyone present today uh, for this presentation. We are um, pleased to be presenting our analyses and findings to the State Board of Education today. Um, and so, uh, again, Lauren Outlaw, I've been with WestEd for a little over a year and a half. Um, I, I work with the resource planning and school choice teams and primarily focus on providing technical assistance to states, districts, and federal grantees um, in an effort to support the efficient and effective use of, of funding, but also to ensure high quality education practices. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, moving on, uh, Jason, if you, could, if you could take us to the next slide. So here are the possible scenarios for how the Dollar Way School District might proceed based on the State Board of Ed's decision. Um, as Ms. Smith explained previously, again, you have the four scenarios that include return to local control, reconstitution, annexation, and consolidation. Um, in, in our subsequent slides, we will sort of address the different state laws and uh, DESE rules that govern each scenario. Um, but, uh, you know, all of that is necessary as you consider your next steps for the future of Dollar Way. Um, and we will get into those nuances as well um, and, and also speak to that more during the working session in December. Uh, next slide, Jason, please. Great, thanks. So next we wanted to just provide you with an overview of what our scenario analysis included. So we reviewed our, the Arkansas state law, the various um, DESE rules, and we also looked into previous State Board of Ed agendas, minutes, strand, uh, excuse me, transcripts and orders. Um, we also, with, in our communications with DESE, um, had access to and, you know, took a deep look into the level five exit criteria, the district support plan, and also the fiscal distress plan. Um, we also, again, had access to the quarterly and other monitoring reports that the Dollar Way School District was required to provide. And so in doing this analysis and to make sure that we had the best information for the State Board of Education to, to guide their decision process, we created a scenario matrix um, and, and a decision tree and discuss discussion guide, both of which you have today, to sort of highlight the key questions um, relevant to your ultimate decision and to facilitate the decision-making process. Next slide, please, Jason. 
Thanks. So in in doing all of all of this, we also established sort of the legal timeline for the State Board of Ed action. And so as you can see here, that began with the December uh, 10th, 2015 action where Dollar Way was identified as being in academic distress and then placed under state authority. Shortly thereafter, Superintendent Warren was appointed. Um, next, in April 2016, Dollar Way was then identified as being in fiscal distress. Um, the next point on the timeline just uh, is, is to emphasize that from 2016 to 2020, the Dollar Way School District was receiving, you know, ongoing and continued support from the state in that they um, were in inconsistent communication and also providing, you know, technical assistance and strategic support. Um, so the next point on the timeline brings us to today where we are meeting with the State Board of Ed members to share an overview of our analyses and findings. Um, after this meeting, we, as um, Ms. Smith mentioned previously, we will participate with you in a working group session to sort of flesh out the our, our considerations for the execution strategies for each scenario. Um, after after that meeting, the December 10th meeting will be when the members of the board are tasked with reaching an ultimate conclusion. And that conclusion will become effective on July 1st of 2021. And with that, I will then pass it off to my colleague, Felicia, excuse me, Felicia Brown-Reed to share an overview of the stakeholder input analysis. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. As Lauren said, my name is Felicia Reed. I have had the pleasure of leading the stakeholder input analysis for this project. Um, I have a background uh, over the last decade or so of doing uh, stakeholder input analysis to inform major decisions about communities all across the country. And so uh, while I love a good legal and budget analysis, I hope that uh, the stakeholder analysis can add a little bit of uh, actual life to this uh, discussion. And um, I, I'll have the pleasure to, to bring that to you today. We're going to start with just an overview of the timeline. So uh, this stakeholder input analysis will take place over two phases. And I'll go over this first phase that happened in early October uh, first, and then we'll go to the second phase after that. Uh, next slide, please. So the phase, the phase one meetings occurred between October 5th and October 13th. These were small group meetings of uh, folks that were in similar roles together. They were facilitated by WestEd and took place over Zoom. Um, so they were all virtual in nature. We offered 20 meeting times to 11 different role types, including teachers, administrators, parents, students, and community leaders. Uh, we advertised this opportunity through the Dollar Way School District website and through 126 personal invitations uh, to various stakeholders throughout the Dollar Way community. And uh, while 74 participants actually confirmed that they would like to attend and signed up for a meeting, we, we had 37 who participated in the end in 13 meetings. Uh, all 11 roles were represented, but for the purposes of analysis, we were, uh, and to maintain anonymity for those groups, we narrowed the list down and you'll see in the uh, following presentation, five different categories of folks, including students, teachers, the, I'm sorry, these are dollar way students, dollar way teachers, um, dollar way school and district administrators put together, uh, parents of dollar way students and uh, community leaders, which uh, spanned a little bit wider than the Dollar Way community specifically and went to the surrounding communities as well. 
Uh, next slide, Jason. Thank you. So these sessions were designed to provide an opportunity for stakeholders to weigh in on what was most important to them and what was concerning about them. As you can see throughout um, our presentation today and these discussion questions, and in accordance with the best practices of stakeholder input from across the country, we did not ask anyone to vote on anything in this first round. We didn't ask specific opinions or getting specific feedbacks on these scenarios. We wanted to solicit opinions without prompt to ensure that input could inform the specifics of how these scenarios were shaping up to be. So the questions were very broad. Um, as uh, the sessions were all designed to be about 60 minutes, they were all exactly the same in structure. We shared a brief video that Mrs. Smith put together uh, about the current options and the scenario that we were facing and providing some context about where we were, but careful not to add anything that wasn't in the legislation. So we just were, were very specific to keep things as vague as they did appear in the legal um, in the, in the legal terms, and so we asked we we went through this context setting and then we started a recording and we asked all the stakeholders five discussion questions in all. We asked them what they valued about Dollarway, what they have seen, how they have seen Dollarway improve, and why they thought that uh, that improvement had occurred. We asked them what they hope would change over the next five years. We asked them for ideas about how to move dollar waste successfully forward, given that this transition was uh, coming up. And we asked them specifically for advice for uh, the Board of Education, for you all, um, what they thought that you should all consider as you were making this choice. Transcripts of these sessions will be made available to you upon your request. Um, but we have tried to distill this information and I will say there are pages and pages and pages of transcripts and they are wonderful. Um, if anyone wants a little light reading, but it is, we have tried our best to distill that information to inform our discussion today. So you'll see that going forward. Next slide, Jason, thanks. Uh, so just one, one piece that we wanted to point out was that before we asked these folks for their input, we did prompt them to think about these four dimensions of effective school management, governing and community engagement, school culture and student supports, student enrollment, staffing and fiscal operations, and academic rigor and excellence. What we know is that each stakeholder came to the discussions with a very specific lens and have a, a natural tendency to talk about that lens. What we wanted to do with this prompt is to say, we want you to consider all these pieces because all of them will be considered as the decision gets forward. So we were able to expand the commentary that um, the stakeholders were able to give. Next slide, please. So at the end of each session, we asked participants to fill out a very brief survey. It took on average 97 seconds. We, we had a technology that was able to time that. 97 seconds for each survey to be completed about their experience of stakeholders in the meeting itself. 25 of the 33 participants who were participated live in the discussions responded to those surveys and the results were overwhelmingly positive, as you can see. 100% uh, agreed or strongly agreed that their input would inform your decision, yours as the, as the board. 96% agreed or strongly agreed that they understood the options for Dollar Way's future. 96% agreed or strongly agreed that the community conversations were well organized and facilitated. And 68% of the group strongly agreed to that. And then 100% agreed or strongly agreed that they were able to share their perspective during those conversations. And again, 68% strongly agreeing. So this data shows that stakeholders really valued the opportunity to give their input and believed it would make a difference. And we actually heard a lot of comments about that. There was um, a, an open-ended question at the end of that uh, very brief survey that was optional. And we had many, many folks in that open-ended 
part say, you know, thank you, as you can see in the quotes below, thank you for hearing us out. Thank you for including us. Um, thank you for giving voice to the dollar way community as you make this decision. And, and we really got a sense that you were making this decision with us and not, uh, and not for us. And so um, overwhelmingly that phase one stakeholder meetings went very well. Um, and the quotes you see here were selected because they represented the breadth of uh, open-ended comments that we had, uh, we had seen in that satisfaction survey about the, the meetings themselves. Uh, Jason, can, can you go to the next slide, please? So that now, now that you have a sense of how the meetings took place, I'll talk a little bit about how we analyzed the data in preparation for today. Next slide. Uh, so first we transcribed the discussion portion of the meetings only. We used an AI software to do that. And then we scrubbed those transcripts for any identifying information and uh, being able to remove anything that was, um, that even alluded to an identity. We wanted to make sure we were keeping anonymity for folks. And then we manually checked for transcription errors. Once we had all those uh, discussions in written form, we were able to identify some of the high level trends uh, based on our experience. So what were some of those words that we heard over and over again and sentiments that we hold, had over and over again? And we coded each comment in accordance with that. We analyzed those conceptual tags and summarized those themes and prepared the slides that you'll see today um, for both generally, which I'll go over in just a second, and each scenario. So we, we didn't specifically ask folks to talk about each scenario, but we were able to pull some of the information that was relevant to each of those scenarios that we'll share later. And uh, finally, we were able to illustrate some of the main concepts by pulling out some of the wonderful quotes that came out of these meetings. And based on uh, the, the selection of those quotes was based on honestly, which one was succinct and could fit in a little box on the slide, um, as opposed to in paragraphs and paragraphs, and um, which were the most Ill illustrative of the what the group said overall. So you'll be seeing those quotes throughout, and those are just to give you a little flavor about what those numbers mean. And the last thing I would say on the, the analysis process was honestly, there were not very many outliers. Above all uh, in the stakeholder analysis, what surprised me the most was how consistent the feedback was from role to role, from person to person. Um, we got a lot of the same sentiments over and over again, and you'll see that um, in the feedback. So we're, we're excited to share some of that input with you, and we'll share it right away before we get into the scenarios um, some, with some high-level themes. Next slide, Jason. So here's the top four sentiments of the stakeholders across the board that were most positive about Dollar Way. 93% of those folks who participated expressed that Dollar Way's culture has improved in the last three years. And this is what Ms. Smith was alluding to. Most of them had that three-year timeline and not a five-year timeline. They were really think of in, thinking of improvements in the last three years. And they specifically noted um, that the administration was able to incorporate student and stakeholder feedback, student engagement in the classroom was up, disciplinary practices were, um, were improved, teacher professional learning communities were in place, culture and climate surveys helped to uh, shape the, the student experience and student retention was up. We even had uh, one or two students who mentioned that the food and drink availability was improved, uh, which was very important to them as students. So, Definitely those cultural pieces had improved and 93% on their own uh, mentioned that. The, the next one was that Dollar Way has this strong family-like community and that word family came up over and over and over again. 90% of the folks who we, we talked to made this, uh, made this uh, sentiment that it, this was a family-like community. There were strong relationships between students and adults, 
adults are supportive of each other. Um, for, so those adult to adult relationships are stronger. And uh, they, there was a sense that everyone kind of takes care of each other. There was a, always someone to go to when you were in need. The next one also at 90% was that dollar waste academic outcomes are on the rise. Uh, we heard things about teacher instructional capacity being increased due to some professional development activities that were happening. Interim student outcome data was showing academic improvement and students uh, were finding the instruction more effective and engaging in the classroom itself. And finally, the, the last one, which, which was at about 57%, was that Superintendent Warren's leadership specifically has brought about positive change. So by name, people were mentioning Superintendent Warren at about 57%. Um, they mentioned her expert understanding of education reform, her communication skills, commitment to shared decision-making and stability and, and long tenure as a superintendent. And that lack of uh, turnover was, was important to the community. Next slide, please. We did also uh, get so the top four, we summarized the top four concerns that they had. And you'll see these numbers are a little less consistent, but still pretty high if you're considering that these were uh, unprompted. We didn't ask, are you concerned about X? We said, what are you concerned about? And this is what came up over and over again. Um, the highest one was I Dollarway's identity as a critical part of the community. And um, they were mentioning things like district, the district's name, mascot, school buildings have a strong community recognition. Families have a long history in the Dollar Way schools. There was a fear of losing that identity uh, and as a result of community decline. And the many mentioned the Alzheimer district and how um, the school district loss there was um, harmful to the community overall, the sense of community, and um, that many businesses were relying on those schools for, for um, keeping their business up. 73% mentioned in some way that Dollar Way needs to offer additional services and programs for students, uh, including mental health services, expanded co course offerings, college and career pathways, parent engagement efforts, academic remediation supports, uh, technology assistance, and additional high quality teachers as Mrs. Smith uh, uh, identified before. So that was about 73% or uh, three quarters of the group. And two thirds of the group said uh, on, on their own that they were concerned that they wanted more input in the decision ahead and they wanted to have this input. And they they often paired that with, thank you so much for this, this opportunity. We would like to continue to have these kind of opportunities as the decision gets made ahead. They were specifically concerned about the current vague definitions of these options. And we were purposeful about that because we didn't have answers for them. Those are your choices to make. Um, but they, they wanted to know more about the specifics. They were um, fearful of the decisions being made without regard to community input and, um, or the special characteristics of the community. There was an appreciation for the opportunity to weigh in during these uh, phase one meetings and they would like more stakeholders to get involved in the discussion. The numbers were uh, concerning to a lot of folks. They wanted to see more and more folks to get involved in this, um, in these input opportunities. And finally on this, uh, one of the main concerns for about half of the participants was that Dollar Way was just not ready to return to local control. Um, that they only had about three years of, of substantive change, not really five, they weren't seeing the full five years of, um, of impact there. They needed more time to demonstrate growth and develop skills that the COVID and assessment cancellation uh, makes it more difficult to show improvements in results. They were concerned about their, their ability to prove that they have uh, made these in, improvements overall. There was some skepticism about the ability of a local ele elected board to continue the, with the positive momentum. There was an attribution of recent growth to being uh, that they were attributing recent growth to being under state control 
and finally, they were um, they believed that some previous leaders were not necessarily responsible about the use of funds and wanted to to make sure that funds were used responsibly going forward. So we'll go over all this feedback in relation to the specific scenarios in just a moment, but we wanted to give you a taste of what we found and that you'll see these themes pop up over and over again. Next slide, please. So finally, uh, just as I alluded to before, there is a phase two of this plan. We, have, uh, we will be presenting some more specifics on each of these scenarios as we move forward. And um, we're, we're gonna go back with those more specific details to the community and ask for more of their feedback. So this will be less about big blue sky thinking about what their concerns and ideas were and more specifically about what do you think about this? Is it gonna work? Is it, what's gonna work about it? What's not gonna work about it? What should we consider? Um, so next slide, please. In the next phase, which will take place starting next week, we'll be holding three different ways for people to, to weigh in. We'll have four open comment or open public forums where anyone can come in for the virtual sessions that will be scheduled throughout the week to uh, give feedback on their, uh, on their specific, on the specific scenarios. They will have an opportunity to weigh in on a feedback survey. Um, that will be open until the 25th of November that will be online so that they can go on and say, here's what I think about this scenario or that scenario. And finally, the open comment period um, where anyone can just write in as you see, uh, as they see fit. Uh, and that concludes uh, the analysis portion of the stakeholder feedback. You'll see my portions for the rest of this, the day today will be very short. Um, so we wanted to give you enough background so you really understood what was going on. And I'll turn it back over to Jason. Great, thanks Lauren and uh, Felicia. So to round out the fourth component of the kind of methods that we used in our analysis of Dollar Way School District, uh, the financial and operations analysis at a very high level um, include two uh, important assumptions. The first, that the return to local control scenario, which is the first of four we'll present uh, this morning, is used as essentially a baseline for the analysis. So it really presumes status quo would continue with the way that Dollar Way um, is operating, um, with the most substantial change, of course, being that it would go back to local control with its own school board, superintendent, so on and so forth. Um, the second of, uh, set of bullets there that you can see is just an overview of the data and the implications that were analyzed. Um, in addition to um, the past five years of audit documentation, also looking at the fiscal distress plans, including the quarterly updates to the State Board, meeting, State Board of Education, which all of you have had access to, um, but also looked at um, a set of information around uh, budgets, timelines, facilities, operations, recent staffing changes, the opportunities for incentive funding um, specific to the annexation and consolidation options. We'll talk about those in a bit. Um, but also looking at transportation opportunities for potential cost savings um, that would result ultimately in either an increase in revenue uh, for dollar way under any one of those four options and or a reduction in expenditures um, that really speak to exactly what Mrs. Smith was um, identifying before, which is um, basically stemming the tide of a continued decline in their uh, unrestricted net ending balance, which is a critical component of maintaining fiscal health um, for any district in, in Arkansas. So a little bit more about the financial analysis um, and our methodology. Um, first, that we used a comparative financial analysis set of tools to look at future scenarios. So once um, kind of controlling for the return to local control scenario, we then would make assumptions about changes in either revenue line items or expenditure line items that would project what dollar way might look like from a financial and operational standpoint in that scenario beginning with the next school year, which is the 2021-22 the uh, school year. Uh, importantly, the assumptions that we presumed in the analysis is that we would want to maximize the cost efficiencies. So importantly, particularly when uh, we were looking at issues of school mergers, uh, we really were looking for what were the best ways in which to maximize the cost efficiencies. This didn't include 
feedback from stakeholders in Dollarway, which will be important should the board decide to move down any one of those options going forward. But for the purposes of the presentation today and the deliberation over the course of the next month, we thought it was important to present some of the maximum opportunities for cost efficiencies through those scenarios, um, and we'll talk a bit more about that as well. Just a brief note on data sources, we relied primarily on local and state data here in the state of Arkansas and in Jefferson County and the Dollar Way community. We did supplement some of that information with federally based, for example, U.S. Census Bureau information that populated the maps that, state, that Mrs. Smith had presented around changes in population, both overall as well as um, school-aged uh, children. Um, importantly, we also thought it was uh, in, important to incorporate um, some of the other environmental context that was happening in Dollarway. This is in particular uh, referencing economic activity, other government contributions that were coming into the school district's um, financial situation, but also the changes in local businesses. I think the most notable of which is the opening of the new casino, um, which I understand just happened about a month ago. And so as activity ramps up, specifically with that casino in the Pine Bluff School District, um, they will begin making more substantial contributions to the tax base on a variety of um, contributions both to the city, but also to the school district. And in some of the scenarios that we'll talk about, Dollarway would benefit from those proceeds from the casino um, that are coming to uh, the Pine Bluff School District. Um, as I mentioned before, we only consider the scenarios for Dollarway and Pine Bluff School District. We removed any of those one-time federal funds that I mentioned and where reasonable uh, made additional funding assumptions um, that we added into the protection. So, you know, ongoing uh, new casino revenue, the trigger of temporary one-time state funds as a result of the decision that is made by the state board. So a couple of key spending assumptions um, to keep in mind as we go through the, these, three scenar these four scenarios. The first um, of which is really when we were examining the labor costs, we looked to identify overlaps in positions. So we basically pooled every job description from both Pine Bluff and from Dollar Way School District and did a side-by-side -side analysis to look for comparables, right? So if in one district it might have been labeled as an instructional aid, and in another district, it might have been labeled as an instructional assistant. We would equate those two positions as we were considering some of the future scenarios, for example, in an annexation or consolidation uh, scenario in which you would have to bring together the contracts um, of both of those uh, individuals that were coming into that single entity. Um, we identified possible efficiencies at the central office level for reconstitution, annexation, and consolidation scenarios. So looking at how do you minimize the amount of administrative overhead for the school district while maintaining the integrity of the necessary um, duties that are responsible for the central office from either um, an overall administrative perspective, from a curriculum instruction perspective, but also from a finance and operations perspective. And importantly, when we looked at uh, adjusting salaries and benefits, we thought it was important to take a conservative approach. Um, so going back to this example of the instructional aid and the instructional assistant, um, depending on the scenario, if you were moving one position into the other, obviously if that other position in, say, in Pine Bluff had a slightly higher salary and compensation level, we assumed the higher level of compensation, which in, in fact would actually invert the savings, would bring down the amount of overall savings on the expenditure side of the ledger that dollar we would be experiencing in any one of these scenarios, um, but thought it important to, uh, to, to raise, that, um, raise that assumption. And some of the major themes that you'll hear today, many of which Mrs. Smith has already raised, I think importantly is to, to pay attention to enrollment and enrollment trends in both of these systems. Uh, for school districts, both here in the state of Arkansas, but across the country, enrollment um, is the lifeline, the, the bloodline, if you will, that keeps a school district going. It is the basis for the vast majority of revenues that school districts receive. Uh, and that enrollment, the way that it is um, it is distinguished into schools or into a school district is a critical component of um, thinking about the overall fiscal health of any, any school district. Um, one other thing that I will mention uh, before moving into uh, just a, a pause to take any questions or comments you might have about the methodology um, is to say thinking about other factors that have been raised already, especially the novice number of teachers uh, and the, the constant over, you know, turnover in staff but also the conditions of facilities weighs on the, fin the financial 
uh, health of any school district, um, especially when you think about the, the costs associated with recruiting, training, and bringing teachers up to speed and providing high quality instruction, or having to maintain buildings over time uh, that perhaps are not at full capacity or being maximized to the use of, of the school district over time. We'll touch on those as we move through, but at this point I just wanna pause I know that's about 30 minutes of, of introducing just the methodology, so I just want to offer an opportunity for the board to ask any questions you might have about the methodology. We'll start here with Ms. Newton. I, I have a little bit of concern when, when I see the stakeholder meetings only having 33 participants, you know, and I know that y'all reached out and you did all, all that you could. I guess my question is, you, uh, I think she said there was a, um, a lot of consistency in the feedback and, and my question is is that consistency because we had such a small pool and and we weren't able to reach out and get into the whole community and then my other concern is you know it looks like all of our meetings are virtual and I know in the day and age that we're in right now that's probably all that we can do but that that is concerning to me because I know that in rural communities and in different parts uh, of um, even urban communities, having access to um, technology and internet is not also always possible for every household. And so that is also a concern. So those were my two big concerns in that considered, considered mostly around stakeholders because I, I understand where they're coming from. They want to have input and, and it's vital to their community the success of their school district. So. Yeah, thank you, Member Newton, for your, for your comment. Um, a couple things that, that I'll offer and then I'll invite um, Felicia to add any additional um, commentary is that the, we spent an extensive amount of time working with both Mrs. Smith and Superintendent Warren in constructing an outreach strategy that I think was directly responsive to the concern that you raised. Uh, in fact, the, the, in leading up into that outreach, um, the trend has been with that school district that it's been tough to get people to come out and to participate. And I think that's why, you know, when you, when you saw Mrs. Reed kind of present those um, efforts of outreach, we went kind of above and beyond um, phone calls, emails, two to six follow-ups with every participant that wanted to participate in the session to make sure that we could bring them in. Um, you know, we at WestEd always think that there's room for improvement. Um, and as we head into the next stage of engagement, um, I think we're going to kind of double down on those efforts, particularly as uh, the decision, you know, before the state board gets closer. Have you given any thought to to um, provide? I don't. You may have done this. I don't know. Providing a space at the district where someone that did not have access to technology that would be a space that they could come and participate virtually, if if that if that was offered. Yeah, uh, Felicia, do you want to jump in on that one? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. We did. Um, we we did offer opportunities for someone to come in virtually, uh, it, to come into a space into the district and participate virtually. And we offered phone only opportunities, so everyone was able to participate either via phone or um, by coming into the district. And uh, actually, two or three people took us up on just participating via phone and no one took us up on the on the offer to come into the district to participate with the technology in the building itself um, so we we did offer those opportunities and we were well aware that not everyone would have access to the um, the technology that they needed so we tried to do as much as we can to accommodate oh yeah Um, so I do want to acknowledge that, um, you know, it, putting the stakeholder community feedback together, piece together um, was rushed, okay? So there's not a lot of forefront time. That's why we, we chose to do the personal contacts, the emails, calling people, asking your friends. Another decision that was made, and it was deliberately made, was to only do feedback from the Dollarway community. We have actually had lots of people reach out to us from Jefferson County as a whole, especially Pine Bluff wanting to give feedback and we made the decision that we felt like it was very important because this was the dollar school district to to close off a piece of time 
just to hear from Dollar Way. Um, previously, um, when they had tried to establish a community advisory board, we had a very difficult time at the state level trying to get participants or volunteers to do that. We did go into this knowing that we might not get a great turnout, but we felt like it was still important to carve out time and try to do that personal piece with Dollar Way. We are hoping on round two to be able to reach directly back out to those before that wanted to participate um, and open it up for further input even from more of Jefferson County and not just the Dollar Way School District on that. Do you think that because this time you're going to be, offer, be able to offer some specifics that that might in, encourage more people to participate? I think so and I think too also just that you know the reality of okay what are we talking about again okay. um, I will say that you did at the same similar timeline you had go forward Pine bluff who was also releasing their report they were doing community feedback sessions within Jefferson County as a whole they were having participation on some of their meetings but again it was countywide right. um, you know and so all of that was kind of coordinated together we did work with mr. mr. Um, dr. Watley and you know we knew what he was doing and, and he mentioned in those meetings hey dollar way this is what the Department of Ed's doing this is where you can go sign up for that um, but we we I'm disappointed that the number that actually participated as far as the number of contacts but I don't know that we were completely surprised okay, okay. All right. thank you mm -hmm. okay I'm gonna allow for uh, Miss Chambers did you have a question Oh, there's a lot of background noise here right now. Can you hear it? No, not really. No, you're, we can hear you fine. Uh, certainly, I think Ms. Smith just answered one of my questions, which is which she said round two, and I, I'm assuming that's phase two then of the, of the stakeholder engagement plan can be uh, we can cast a wider net or at least try to make sure that it, maybe it's the same 33, 37, but there's an opportunity for more to participate. So I, I think that's I think that's good. I do have a question, and I, I don't know if it's for the department or for this group that is helping us, but the decision, uh, the statement that we're not considering any other schools in Jefferson County or any other districts, I just wanted to confirm at some point, maybe in our work session, why that is. Maybe it's very appropriate because there aren't any other schools to consider or, or districts to consider because they're not, there's no interest. But that's something that I had a question about. Um, and also a question for the, the group that is doing this, and I so appreciated Secretary Key's comments earlier. This is a very good process. I appreciate the thought that's gone into this and this vehicle for communicating it, not only to the board, but to the community in terms of why and the how. And I think that's so helpful. I know we'll continue to improve on that, but I think this is a very big step. I just wanted to express my appreciation for it. Ms. Chambers, I'll, uh, I'll answer the question about the other districts. Uh, the, the other two districts in Jefferson County uh, had expressed um, opposition. Sorry, it's wrong. I hit the hit wrong the button. Okay, I'm trying, I'm trying to avoid my feedback situation here. Okay, I think we're good now. All right, so Watson Chapel uh, in, in the Go Forward Pine Bluff work, Watson Chapel had been included uh, by Go Forward Pine Bluff, but through that process, um, or at some point in that process, the Watson Chapel School Board uh, issued a statement or I think they even took a vote and very uh, clearly said they were not interested in any type of consolidation countywide or anything else. And uh, Whitehall was uh, in the same situation. So you know, we, we, the state is not really in a situation now to compel either one of those districts to do anything because they are not in any type of state um, oversight. Uh, so that's why we uh, we limited this uh, review to the two districts that are under state authority right now. I hope that helps answer your question, Ms. Chambers. Yes, thank you. Ms. Woods. Ms. Newton has the one question I had. Okay. Dr. Moore. Ms. McPetridge. Mr. Sutton. I can't see you. No, 
<clears throat> no question. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lukadu. Dr. Hill, okay. All right, well, if there are no further questions, I think this is a good time to take a break, a pause really quickly. Um, let's reconvene at 1040.
I'm gonna give everyone an opportunity to get to their seats and then we'll get started. And then I'll finish it out on the financial and operational analyses uh, and bring us home with the execution strategies for consideration for each of, the, each of those scenarios. Uh, just a reminder that you have the discussion guide um, that is color coded and color themed uh, that is in front of you. So um, we're headed into the, the return to local control segment here. Uh, Lauren, you wanna uh, touch on the legal requirements and considerations for return to local control, please? Uh, Lauren, are you there? Oh, you're are, on mute. Are you, there you, are go. you able to hear me? Yep, there my you apologies. go. <laughs> my apologies. So as we have um, discussed previously, both uh, Mr. Willis and also Ms. Smith, there are different state codes and um, DESE rules that govern each of the scenarios by classification, whether it's the um, level five intensive support or in need of fiscal distress. So this slide provides an overview of what those different um, statutory codes and DESE rules indicate for um, the return to local control. So to start with the, the state code under the level five intensive support, uh, the law states that the state board may approve a return to local control upon the commissioner um, recommending that it do so. The, and, and all of the citations are also provided. Um, the state code regarding fiscal distress indicates that the commissioner may return the district to local control if DESE has certified in writing um, and that the state board uh, determines that the district has corrected any sort of, um, or excuse me, any of the fiscal d distress criteria, um, you know, that, that uh, required it to be taken over by the state. So moving to the return to local control rules for the level five intensive support, uh, those rules indicate that the state board may approve that the level five exit criteria has been met um, and move the district from level five intensive support to level four directed support for one year. And there are also additional parameters around um, reporting and requirement, or excuse me, reporting and monitoring requirements to both DESE and the state board uh, this rule also specifies that the state board may return the district to local control through either the appointment or election of new board, a new board of uh, a new local board, including those members. Um, to, flipping to fiscal distress, these rules also provide that the district may petition the state board for a return to local control upon DESE certifying that the district has met the uh, level five exit criteria um, and has not experienced any additional indicators of fiscal distress during the five-year time period. Um, and then also that it, 
it's met the DESE requirements for removal from the fiscal distress classification. And, and so with that, I will um, turn the next slide over to, again, my, my colleague, uh, Felicia Brown, to talk through the findings for local control uh, around the stakeholder engagement analyses. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, so for each of these scenarios, we'll go through just some high level pieces that are specifically relevant to each of the scenarios. And to your point made earlier, keep in mind the number of folks, we had 37 folks who responded to the questions. So the numbers are small, but the consistency is, uh, is pretty astounding. So um, given that we have multiple places of uh, multiple sources of data, we want to consider their stakeholder input as one of those sources and see how it aligns with the other pieces. Um, so the, the three pieces that we'll present for returning to local control is that again, an overwhelming majority of stakeholders expressed that they desire Dollar Way School District to retain its identity its name and its history, many citing generations of family members who were proud to be Dollar Way Cardinals and that uh, Cardinal mascot really has meaning to the community. Next slide, please. Uh, the second piece is that about half of the stakeholders expressed, again, spontaneously, we didn't ask them, are you concerned about this, yes or no, um, whether they were, they, about, I'm sorry, about half of them uh, expressed that they were concerned that a locally elected school board, including the ability to select school board members, um, were from the local community was a concern for moving forward. They felt that um, those school board members might not have enough educational background um, on education reform, that they might have uh, financial skill gaps, or uh, that they may not be dedicated to the position beyond being a political stepping stone. And about half of the folks mentioned this in different ways. You can see some of those quotes there. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, most of the stakeholders expressed in some way this pride in the progress that Dollar Way has been making over the last five years and specifically the last three years. Uh, particularly under Superintendent Warren's consistent and strong leadership. But about 57%, a little over half, feared that a return to local control would mean a change in leadership that would reverse that progress. So they wanted to make sure that progress was continuing forward um, and feared that returning to local control may, may halt or reverse that improvement. Jason. Thanks, uh, Felicia. So some of the kind of key financial and operational findings for local control. Um, so again, here, resuming uh, that control over all um, finance and operational functions would revert back to local administrators. Um, I think really importantly, uh, one thing to consider in this option is the capacity for both the financial and operational staff um, in the school district that have um, benefited from a tremendous amount of support from DESE and the DESE staff, um, and that there should be some considerations of what does it mean um, to pull back on that state support in allowing the school district to return to both maintain uh, decisions around budgeting, accounting, human resources, and facilities, especially in a state in which uh, the unrestricted net ending balance is um, so close um, to potentially going negative given the trend that we've uh, presented a bit earlier. Uh, we also um, note that the kind of continued transition of surplus property um, and those sale transactions, which also have benefited from uh, state staff support, would revert back to uh, local administrators. This slide here, um, and you'll see this repeated several times throughout the remainder of the presentation, presents a summary of both the revenues expenditures, which are the two top portions that you can see there for Dollar Way School District, followed by the net increase and decrease in balance is a simple equation of what um, amount of revenues you have minus the expenditures that you are planned to expend um, in the subsequent school year in this case, what the beginning balance looks like, and then what the resulting net ending balance would, would be. Now, I will note that these numbers look a little bit different, um, in part because the slide that was presented earlier by Mrs. Smith is only looking at unrestricted resources. Dollarway also has access to restricted revenues, 
uh, Title I dollars, IDEA special education funds, but also state restricted dollars. Um, those are also incorporated into the analysis to provide a full picture um, of Dollarway's financial circumstance. So I'm um, getting to the execution strategy. So this is the, the portion where we kind of take a step back and say, if the State Board of Education was to certify that the state that uh, Dollarway School District had met the criteria for exiting academic, they had met the criteria for um, financial, um, for moving out of financial distress, that uh, they could move on this path. And these would be some of the considerations that we would put in front of the State Board. Um, the first of which is, um, should the State Board be appointed or elected? Based on our analysis, we think that um, they should be appointed by the State Board of Education. Uh, this would allow for continued kind of control and oversight um, in maintaining and ensuring that the board members have a growing amount of knowledge about dollar way and the support that the state has been providing to the school district over time. Moving to decision point B, uh, what are the powers and duties of the new school board? This is a, um, you will see this consistently, this is a footnote, you can see at the bottom of the slide. This question is legally required to be, um, to be decided. Um, as, the as this governance option is considered, potentially. Um, and in this case, uh, we would suggest, based on our analysis, that the school board provides accountability for sound financial and academic decisions that would be in accordance with predetermined criteria from the state. So what this allows is really a, an alignment of expectations from the state to the school district that the school board can follow through on in working with the superintendent and the staff to ensure that those predetermined criteria are being met. Um, we would also suggest that the school board does not uh, choose initially the superintendent um, for, the, for the school district itself. And again, would allow some ability for the state to remain involved, to help with the transition. Um, in our experience at West Ed, um, given uh, the experience of the team, this kind of rip off the Band-Aid and kind of quickly transition has never effectively worked well. Um, in looking at the state's support to school districts that are in academic and fiscal distress. So even in this option of a return to local control, it kind of gives a gradual release of responsibility back to the school district to stand uh, on their own. Uh, this decision point uh, C, what reporting to the state board would be required? Um, we think this should center around the predetermined academic and financial criteria that I just referenced. And again, creates a lot of alignment between what is expected of the state and how the school district is then responding to those criteria um, and reporting back to the state board and to DESE in regards to um, that predetermined criteria. Um, a couple of notes about the implications for, the, for their financial um, uh, state, their millage rates, and for their operations. Again, uh, dollar way in this circumstance would continue under their current state. Millage rates would remain the same unless uh, there was an election um, that was, and there was a decision to raise millage above the uh, current maintenance and operation of those 25 mills. Uh, revenues, we would project um, a continued decline uh, based on continued decline in student enrollment. Uh, we've seen even some of the preliminary numbers for the 2020-21 school year for Dollaway also continue to show um, a decline over prior years. So we would expect that the local school district in this case would have to be making continued decisions about cutbacks to ensure expenditures were coming in line with available revenues. Uh, and finally, that um, Dollarway would not have access to the supplemental consolidation or annexation dollars um, that would be made available by the state um, should the board uh, choose to move in this direction or return to local control based on the, on the criteria. So other staffing changes uh, ultimately would be decided by the superintendent and the leadership of the school district. Um, that would be out of the control of, of the state, um, save the conversations with the board and with the superintendent. And then the role of DESE moving forward um, would be in choosing that superintendent initially, um, monitoring that progress against those predetermined criteria of success, and then providing where necessary that technical assistance to key operational positions to ensure the kind of maintenance and continuous improvement of the district, either on the curriculum instruction and academic side, um, the financial and operations side, or any other element of the, of the district's work. Again, we think that these, um, these, these suggestions really offer the opportunity for um, a smooth transition between the state back to local control for, for Dollar Way School District, um, should the board decide to move down this path. So let me pause there. Um, that is the first of four uh, scenarios that, um, that uh, we want to offer our analysis for and take any questions that uh, the board might have. 
Dr. Hill, do you have a question? Um, Mr. Williamson on the guy? Ms. Newton? I guess my question goes back to the financial. You're saying that um, the, the balance is going to continue to, to decline. In, so I, I, I'm not if we're already in danger, you, you understand where I'm going, going with this? I do, yes, okay. yes. I, I, our, our role here um, today is, is really to present an independent and objective analysis. Okay. Um, but the, your line of thinking, I think, is the right place to be looking in terms of um, their continued decline um, relative to both enrollment and what they're seeing in their ending balance, um, which likely brings you to a conclusion that they probably are not meeting um, the financial criteria based on the two indicators, um, two primary um, indicators that Mrs. Smith presented this morning. And so when you were giving us the financial, you were looking at the best case scenario, am I, am I right, financially? Uh, yes, based on based on like what we could see into the future in terms of their enrollment. Now, of course, that could change sure. uh, in terms of either a more precipitous decline based on certain conditions or a stabilization of those enrollment uh, of that enrollment. But we don't see any information currently okay. that would suggest either of those scenarios. So, so even at best case scenario, the finances are going to continue to decline. In our judgment, yes. Members, do you have any questions? Ms. Chambers, do you have a question? I do not. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Ms. Woods. I don't know if this is a question for you or for the state. Um, do we know why the enrollment is decreasing in dollar way? Is it a school choice? Is it just people moving out of the area? A combination of all the factors. This reflects the trend that we see in the population of Jefferson County over the last couple of decades. Okay. And uh, I think uh, the school choice has had some impact, but not to the same degree as just the population decline of the county mm -hmm. uh, since probably 2000. Have we seen more in like the last decade versus the previous ones, or has, I mean, has it sped up as of recent times, or no? Is it just been a I, I don't think we would say that it has sped up. I think it's been a pretty steady okay. decline. I, 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 I'd say probably since 2010, mm -hmm. because 2010, if you look at just the, the balances that were there that, and, and the, the student population that was there in 2010, I think the last decade you've seen some acceleration. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Woods, I mean, Dr. Moore, excuse me. So we currently, <coughs> there is not a community advisory board in Dollar Way. Um, I actually forgot that there was an option to have an appointed board. Do y'all know, or whoever answered the question, if that were to be the case and the state were to appoint a board, what would be the terms of that? Would there, I mean, there would eventually be an election. Is there, I don't think we have any precedents for that. That's a question I would say we probably need to take down and, and get a response to you later. Okay. Um, we, we would have to look at that. Yeah, appointed board is an option, how that relates to then the uh, ongoing governance uh, and how a board is structured with respect to terms and those types of things, we would uh, get that, go take that question back and get you an answer maybe for the work session. Okay, and second, again, maybe a question answer later, but I know as Ms. Warren is serving a capacity as superintendent in two districts, is there anything to prevent that? Was there any waivers or exceptions the state had to get to allow that to occur? Um, uh, I think we 
Right. Yeah, and it, I mean, if if, it, if if a district weren't under state control, would that be something that would still be able to do? I don't remember if we had to do something in the standards for accreditation system. Yeah. Yeah. We did that. I think last was it last meeting. I think we, we did. Yeah. Okay. So and that would be in, I'm assuming an annual. Right. Decision. Okay. That that's if you if they maintained two, two separate, separate district entities. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McVittrich. I know you've got, what, four more work sessions, I believe, out in the community next week? Is uh, yeah, yes, that's, that would be phase one of our, our, our outreach in addition to um, some of the survey input and some of the other feedback we would get before December 1st, okay. yes. Is there any other, is there any new information you hope to gather from these sessions that we're not seeing in your information? Uh, so the so the information that we're presenting today um, has not been presented to the to the Dollarway community. So, um, in part, what we hope to do is um, present some of the information that we're presenting before you today, um, to then get the response from the Dollarway community on the more detail behind each of the scenarios. As Mrs. Um, Reed was, as Felicia was was representing when we originally went out to the stakeholder community, we really just had the the very large summary descriptions of the four options. So this provides a substantially um, additional amount of detail for each of the scenarios. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Sutton. No questions. All right, Mr. Lukadu. All right, okay, thank you. you can go ahead and move forward. Okay, great. So uh, let's move on now to the second of three options into reconstitution and Lauren, uh, you wanna jump in? Yes, thank you, Jason. Uh, so the next uh, scenario that we evaluated as we were uh, reviewing Dollarway's history and possible options for the state board to execute for Dollarway's future was reconstitution. Um, and here, similar to the return to local control slide, we have distinguished between the state code or statute that um, establishes parameters for reconstitution in addition to the DESE roles that also, um, you know, provide additional guidance, definitions, um, details on how to proceed. Uh, I, we wanted to note that reconstitution under the Arkansas Fiscal Assessment and Accountability Program is defined as the reorganization of the administrative unit or the governing school board of directors of a school district, including but not limited to the replacement or removal of a current superintendent or the removal or replacement of a current board of directors or both. So that is uh, the, the state's current definition on, on what reconstitution means. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, again, similar to the local control uh, slide that we discussed previously, we've separated the both the statutory code and rules by the level five intensive support or academic distress classification and also the fiscal distress classification as well. Um, and so I, I in, you know, given that we have some, some more details to get through, I will just leave this here for a moment so that everyone can read through it, but also note that the nuances of, of both reconstitution, but also the other scenarios, something that we will continue to discuss throughout this presentation and also, you know, take a deeper dive when we reconvene um, in our December working session including recent for the reconstitution scenario, uh, the recent Little Rock reconstitution example, talking that through uh, what that means, how it was done, and addressing any uh, similarities uh, between that decision and the one before the state board for Dollar Way School District. And, and with that, uh, I will turn it back to Felicia. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I will start by saying that the, the reconstitution option, we explained it to the stakeholders by saying 
uh, basically what was in that little square in the four square slide that you saw before that just means reconstitution is defined as something will be different in the district. And so I will say it, most stakeholders said, rightfully so, well, what does that mean? And, and that's part of what we want to come back to the stakeholders with in phase two. Um, so we, we have some comments here, but um, this was the most questioned option. A lot of people saw opportunity in it, but also um, had, had some concern about the definition being so vague. Uh, so the first, we, we would say about a third of the uh, folks saw reconstitution as maybe a promising option um, because it might have been open to um, an innovation that would allow the district to preserve local identity and allow for some local choice. Um, and, and again, many stated that this was unclear as an option, but they were saying, this could be an, an interesting option for us to avoid that loss of district, of district identity and um, bring in some innovative options. Next slide, please. Um, about three quarters of the stakeholders really described this desire to see innovative solutions that would expand offerings uh, for students and staff in the districts and attract more students to the district. As we saw, um, enrollment is declining and many, many uh, of the stakeholders were aware of that. Um, they shared a lot of great ideas about how Dollarway might be uh, perceived as a, a place where more students wanted to go and um, shared some ideas there. So some of them were about you know, offering magnet programs for specialty coursework, leveraging community partnerships for wraparound services, attaching the district to the university to create a stronger pipeline for both teachers and for students, um, to, for teachers into the district and for uh, students to college, and offering college scholarships to students who might complete their K-12 schooling within the Dollarway district successfully. So they had a lot of ideas and, and many of them uh, attached that, uh, those innovative solutions to the idea of reconstitution, given that it was the most broad in the definitions. Next slide, please. And then finally, again, about 77% of those stakeholders shared that they believe that dollar way um, that if Dollar Way could remain a separate entity, it would really give an opportunity to showcase the district as, um, as a best-in-class rural district. Um, and this is about their commitment to the idea that they were, they're progressing. So uh, keeping the district as a, as a separate entity might be its best chance for continuing the progress that the district has made so far in teacher quality, academic work, culture, student services, and believe that um, given a few more years of this kind of progress, that the district could be, um, and actually multiple stakeholders use the term best in class, could be showcased as this best in class in the state um, or as a model uh, for other rural school districts in uh, across the state because of this uh, current trajectory that they're on. Uh, that's it for stakeholder engagement. Jason. Great. Uh, thanks, Felicia. So um, in analyzing both this and the next three options from a financial and operational standpoint, I'm going to hit on kind of three elements of this. First, the kind of revenue and taxes side, uh, which is you know all the, the dollars that are coming in to support the school district. Um, a second, from the expenditure side that looked at both the labor and non-labor analysis. And then third, from a kind of facilities, capital, and debt analysis. We'll also include transportation in there. Um, and any of the kind of um, important highlights on each of these three areas. So in terms of key finance, uh, financial and operations findings for reconstitution, uh, the, the primary, primary um, uh, cost efficiencies that we really focused on were at the central office and school support level. 
So for example, with transportation, and I think this was one of the primary decisions in um, thinking about what would be different about reconstitution. And so in the way that we analyzed the financial and operational elements of this, we really looked at most and the magnitude of those changes occurring at the central office level, um, which leads to the second point that this presumes, at least for the 21-22 school year, um, should the board decide to move in this direction, that those school-based operations would re remain as is, save any uh, changes that would come about as a result of um, declining enrollment in those schools. So say, for example, enough students were not in the school in the subsequent year, you would reduce an FTE to ensure that class sizes remained um, equal to those that are established in the, in the matrix uh, by, the, by the state. We would also um, suggest kind of pause on any of the unnecessary building repairs and to continue to pursue the sale of that surplus property, generating some one-time dollars um, that would allow for a bit of a cushion for Dollaway to make some of those bigger financial decisions in the future. So again, um, a similar slide here. What we've added um, in this circumstance you can now see is two additional columns. Um, one that um, shows the reconstitution options and how we believe the financials would change as a result. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and the, the final column that would offer the change, so just basically what is the delta between any of the assumptions that we would make. Um, importantly, on this slide, we only show Dollarway School District's financials, and the reason for that is that we believe under a reconstitution option that the two school districts, um, Dollarway and Pine Bluff, would remain separate, at least, um, you know, pending any decision that the state board would make about the relationship between those two school districts. And so we're really still presenting just Dollarway School District's financial um, sta status at this point. Um, we do think that in this scenario there would be a net $470,000 savings as a result of looking at those central office positions coming together, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, so on the revenue side, we don't see any um, substantial shift from one, year, from one uh, scenario to the next across your federal aid, state aid, or local sources. Again, you're leaving out the access to casino revenue, you're leaving out access to one-time revenue, um, choosing a potential consolidation or annexation option. Uh, on the expenditure side, you can see in both the salaries and benefits, um, that net 470,415 is largely a result of the consolidation of what we think some of these positions might be at the central office. So again, um, in taking a step back, the way that we analyzed the central office positions was to examine the job descriptions for each of um, the positions that are available in both the Pine Bluff and the Dollarway School District and um, identified those positions that we think could be collapsed in order to maintain at least the minimum amount of um, effort necessary to continue to operate the school district from a variety of different um, positions. So again, this is our independent and objective analysis, um, and should the board choose to go forward, there would likely be additional analyses required to identify um, which positions would stay and which would go, but we think this would represent the maximum amount of savings possible on your labor line items for Dollaway under this scenario. I mentioned earlier that we would suggest pausing uh, some of the investments in um, any kind of routine maintenance and operation. Uh, for several of the buildings pending some of those future decisions, in large part because, as we've seen over the course of the last five or ten years, many of the buildings that um, are still under uh, ownership by the Dollarway School District have since been closed. You can see that list um, at the very top of this slide. Um, I will note that um, currently the Alzheimer Martin Elementary School, the Alzheimer Administration, and the Alzheimer Highway Campus um, several of those are um, due for demolition, so the land could still be for sale to generate some unrestricted general fund um, dollars for the school district. Um, another one, I believe, is being turned over to the, to the city for, um, for sale, uh, for, for alternate use, but we would continue to encourage the pursuit of the sale of the rest of those properties. And we would also suggest, based on the maintenance and repair plan that uh, Dollarway has submitted, pausing on several of those planned capital projects that constitute uh, nearly $1.1 million worth of investment by the school district. Again, pending some of those future decisions, really being for Dollarway High School, but also for the bus barn that, um, that houses a lot of the transportation for Dollarway School District. We'll talk a little bit in another scenario about the potential options around uh, transportation. So uh, moving to the execution strategies for this option, uh, for Dollarway School District. I want to start with the structure of the reconstituted 
uh, school district itself. Uh, and in particular, again, just to remind the board that this, um, should the board choose this decision is a legally required decision, the board will have to make along with um, the broader decision of moving towards this scenario, um, that the, there would be merged central services between with Pine Bluff School District. Um, it would create some of those efficiencies, but um, we believe that in most circumstances, you're still maintaining separate financial operations, separate human resources operations until there's a decision potentially down the road for a different decision, uh, which, which, which kind of eats away a little bit at some of those cost savings, but still think that those are able to be achieved um, through a, a scenario like this. We also think a scenario really reflecting the stakeholders' input uh, reflects innovative options to kind of attract um, students and improve services uh, that include that could include um, things like services from local providers, magnet programs, and potentially even partnership with UCPB, um, which is um, right next door uh, to the to the school district um, in offering some of those some of those services. Uh, from um, the the decision point B on what date. Uh, dollar way would be reconstituted. Um, you could begin merging those central services nearly immediately after the decision of the board that kind of ramps up into um, the rest of the model as decided by the board by July of 2022. Um, and again, it kind of creates an opportunity to set out a plan so that there's opportunities for sufficient discussion um, leading up to kind of future discussion or future execution uh, of that plan against a vision and, and a structure. We would suggest, based on our analysis, that um, in regards to decision point C around how the local school board would be structured and what powers they would have, would be a uh, seven member board that are constituted of both uh, equal part or semi-equal parts of elected, appointed by the state, but also representatives from the university. We think that this, again, creates an opportunity for the state to uh, continue to help monitor and support um, the local school district, but also have local voice, along with expertise that might be coming from a local university uh, in UCPB. Uh, and this would allow for, again, that kind of combination of um, educational expertise and community. In regards to the financial implications for the revenue, taxes, expenditure, and facilities, um, I talked about the kind of merger of central services to help uh, kind of streamline operational capacity uh, and stave off some of the continued enrollment decline that is eating away at, at revenues. Uh, slowing down the implementation of facilities maintenance, allowing for um, kind of offsetting cost savings, but also real cost savings in the future, um, having not needing to make those investments. Um, and ultimately would be reducing the redundancy in tasks as those two school districts at the central office level come together. Uh, from a staffing perspective, um, the superintendent would remain. Uh, we would hire, reallocate one to two staff positions, overseeing some of those innovative programming and communications, um, and the consolidation of staffing positions, as I mentioned. And the role of DESE would really uh, be one of support uh, for those sta staffing consolidations, helping to train and build capacity of key staff that would remain, and thinking about how to streamline those functions coming across both of those systems. They would obviously have a role uh, in appointing those school, some of the school board members and maintaining kind of close monitoring of key financial and academic indicators. I think that's a theme um, that Mrs. Smith has brought up that we would also bring up as well, that having those objective criteria um, that are not necessarily actions, but are really outcomes that you desire to see in these school systems would be an important consideration. And I think for any of the options that you are considering, um, but clearly here in reconstitution would be a, 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 sta um, a role that we would see DESE uh, playing as well. So again, uh, Madam Chair, I'll pause there for any questions that the board might have. Thank you. Mr. Lokidu, do you have questions? Yeah, when you're saying like, so the pause on the planned uh, spending projects, some of those, the high school roofing and the bus barn, I think, um, are you seeing those as unnecessary uh, for the future to be able to pause on those? Uh, we're not. We're not necessarily seeing them as unnecessary. We're, we're suggesting the pause on the basis of future decisions that might be made. So, if, for example, um, there was a future decision to merge the high schools from Pine Bluff and from Dollarway, um, if you make you know a several hundred thousand dollar investment in a school that you're basically going to vacate in a year, year and a half, we feel that that's money wasted, um, considering that that future option. Mr. Sutton. 
A question about uh, your your comment on sale of facilities. Have they tried to sell excess facilities in the past? Uh, our understanding is that uh, the state has been working with the local school district um, to sell surplus property that is um, that is no longer perceived to be needed or used for for the school district. Yes. Sutton, I can add a little bit to that, if I may. The uh, we've been working for a number of years now to get the Alzheimer campus um, in a uh, situation where it can be transferred to the city of Alzheimer. I think we had some uh, delays because of asbestos abatement and uh, we've, we've had partnerships with the Department of Corrections uh, to try to get some of that work done. Um, and the, the Pine Bluff District, uh, when Dr. Owa was there, uh, they did uh, liquidate a number of the properties that uh, were uh, kind of on the book still. Uh, I don't know how many are remaining, but uh, both both districts have still do have some uh, old buildings or campuses or, or facilities that are out of service now uh, that would need to be disposed of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Pickridge. No, Dr. Moore. Ms. Woods. I just have one, and it's probably because of my misunderstanding of the restricted and the non-restricted funding. So, am I, is it accurate to say that the restricted funding goes, or the yeah, the restricted funding goes away in every outcome except for reconstitution? Uh, in, in none of the scenarios would um, Dalloway and or Pine Bluff lose access to their restricted resources. Um, the, the difference in what we presented in regards to the financial picture in this scenario is slightly different from the fiscal distress criteria the state holds when looking at and evaluating school districts about whether they would enter um, state control or be in fiscal distress or not. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Ms. Chambers. Okay, I'm sorry, I just had to scroll through, I can't see, okay. <laughs> Ms. Newton. Going back to the facility pause, what what percent of um, does Dollarway get as far as partnership funding from the state? Uh, I, I don't have the answer to that question, uh, perhaps. We, we can get that, I mean, I know the f uh, wealth index has changed, so the percentage of state uh, participation has changed. Uh, we can get that information from facilities for you. Okay, because I, I I would think if it's a if it's a high percent on the partnership that that would not be monies that you would want to leave there. You, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yes. I okay. Do. And then my other question was I, I was kind of intrigued by what you had told uh, suggested on the board uh, about three elected, two appointed, and then two representative representatives from the university. Has something like that been done in other places? And if so, what was the success of that? Uh, yeah, so that we have examples from elsewhere in the country in which um, boards have been constituted of both elected members, appointed members by the state, and university partners. Um, and I think as we, we talked about the rationale, um, we think it offers a great mix of both like educational expertise from a research and evidence perspective, local voice, but also the ability for the state to remain involved. Um, as an opportunity to, again, continue to think about um, a longer-term transition as opposed to the states immediately stepping out of that situation with, with the local school district. And, and so when, when you're looking at maybe a work session, maybe we could get a little bit more information on that as far as terms, how long they will last, um, how they would be elected, and that sort of thing. We could get some more information on that. Dr. Hill, okay. Well, with that, um, this is perfect timing. Lunch is ready. So what we'll do is break for lunch and we'll reconvene at 1230. Is that gonna mess you up? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, would, I would prefer to, to kind of get through the end of the presentation. Okay. I, yeah, if, if that's, if that's yeah. okay. Oh, sure, no problem, 30 more minutes. Yeah. No, I don't mind at all. Okay. I was just trying to make sure we had a good we'll, break. We'll jam in there. through it. No, no problem. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> 
Uh, so moving on to the to the annexation option, uh, Lauren, do you want to touch briefly on the legal requirements and considerations? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Jason. So uh, as we've seen on the previous slides, annexation would involve the Dollar Way School District becoming a part of another school district. And so there are legal parameters, again, regarding the law that governs any sort of academic re required support or fiscal distress support. There are also, again, related rules based on those laws. Um, in all, the, the laws and rules establish requirements where the State Board of Ed either you know, can annex the district or is required to actually annex the district. The latter of which being if the school district had not met either their exit criteria for the level five intensive support and or the criteria for uh, fiscal distress and that, that level of exit plan. Um, there are, again, various definitions that we will get into, I think, in more detail for our December 1st meeting. Uh, the affected district, which would be Dollar Way, the one that's losing territory of students, and then the receiving district being the one that takes on the Dollar Way School District. Um, for this scenario, um, you know, the action would be going into effect as of July 1st. Uh, there are also additional parameters around what the local school board would look like moving forward. Um, so again, in, in the effort of time, you know, we, we will get into those nuances uh, in our considerations on execution strategies, but this is also a piece that we plan to dig further into when we come back on December 1st. Felicia. Thanks. Um, so again, with annexation, the, the number one thing that came up was that uh, most stakeholders described how the school district was such a critical component of the economic and cultural welfare of the neighborhood itself. Um, and many cited that um, the annexation of Alzheimer seemed to uh, uh, either erase or uh, put in decline that community's identity and history and economic welfare because of the loss of the school district. So. Uh, that was definitely something they were considering with annexation because that is the, the in, in the eyes of the stakeholders, the most likely scenario where dollar way would sort of be erased um, from existence. Next slide, please. Um, in 70% of the stakeholders, they are about two thirds. There was this fear that having another district annex dollar way at this point would not allow for continued progress and, mo and momentum as they have expressed that pride in the momentum and that um, it would not allow at this point for their hard work and successful progress to be recognized uh, properly. So many teachers and um, administrators and community members said, you know, if, if Dollar Way just goes away at this point, that um, all that hard work that they've been doing may just disappear and be uh, under the auspices of another district. And there was concern over that. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, about half of the stakeholders expressed concern about annexation specifically and its result on that family-like atmosphere of Dollar Way. Um, remember that family was one of the most used words in uh, in the stakeholder input meetings, and um, they, they attributed that family-like atmosphere to the smallness of Dollar Way, and were concerned that if combined with another district, that they would sort of lose that um, that atmosphere that they were prizing so much. Jason. So some of the kind of key financial and operational findings for this option around annexation, um, one of the things we can observe is that the rolling average decline in revenues um, from both school districts that is due um, explicitly to enrollment is roughly about 4.4%. 
However, in the financials that I'll show um, in just a moment, that is more than offset by additional revenues that are coming in through both the, um, the combination of both of the districts. So the size basically creates access to additional resources, um, both one time in nature from the state as a, as a result of the dis potential decision of annexation. Um, also, um, as we've mentioned before, the, um, the startup of the casino in Pine Bluff would create access uh, for, to resources for the Dollar Way community as a result of now being um, annexed into the Pine Bluff community. And again, we would suggest um, kind of pausing any unnecessary building repairs, um, particularly in schools in either district um, that potentially would not be used um, going forward in terms of considerations of potential school merger. Um, so here's a summary look at the change in revenues. You can see there that from a revenue perspective, uh, there is a, um, a pretty substantial uptick in revenues, again, um, due in part to both one-time infusion, um, but also additional revenues that are coming from the, the casino. Uh, and you also see some savings that can be achieved uh, on the expenditure side of the ledger, though, the, though those are mitigated by um, one of the analyses that I had presented um, earlier that looks at needing to consolidate, or sorry, to uh, equate uh, equal positions across both districts that likely would result in increases in compensation for some of the staff uh, coming from Dollar Way to uh, the Pine Bluff School District. So here's a, uh, just a brief look at the summary on revenues. Uh, you can see there for the state aid, um, some of the other, um, all other matrix funding includes um, that one-time infusion of um, dollars. The way that this is structured in state code is that if the state board was either to consolidate or annex a school district, the school district that is receiving the um, annexed school district would receive 100% of that school district's ADA um, in one-time funds for that year, and then 50% of that ADM in the subsequent year um, to be used with um, the, the transition of the school district into the, the, to, into the receiving school district. Um, we also show here on the property tax line item, the vast majority of that $4.6 million um, is made up of the additional revenue um, that is being produced by the casino that is currently estimated around uh, 3.8 or $3.9 million in, in additional revenue. Uh, on the expenditure side of the ledger, um, for salaries and benefits, we have two substantive changes. The first is on um, the salaries uh, line item. Uh, in terms of changes in positions. The other expenditures is due to our analysis around transportation, uh, which I'll present momentarily. Um, here again, uh, we showed this during the reconstitution option, um, the savings of positions. That is that $505,669. Um, this is largely mitigated by the changes um, in those total position compensation uh, adjustments, um, which we estimated about $333,000, which creates that net of $172,457 in savings for your labor uh, line items. So one of the things that we did look at was the merger of school campuses in both the annexation and the consolidation option. Um, the table on the right-hand side um, uh, represents both the elementary schools, uh, the middle schools, and the high schools in both Pine Bluff and Dollarway. Important to this analysis is we looked at um, two key factors, both the capacity of the building that might be taking in these students, and then what the current enrollment is from the one or more campuses that might be coming to that, to that circumstance. What we can see, bottom line for uh, enrollment at the elementary campus level, is that there would not be an opportunity given um, future projected enrollment until 2930, so quite a ways out to consolidate any of those campuses. Um, at the middle school and high school ha level, however, um, we would um, estimate that by the 22-23 year, that the enrollment decline would be substantive enough in both the Pine Bluff and Dollarway school districts that you could merge the campuses at both the middle school and the high school level. And again, here we are looking at this from a financial and operational standpoint um, in looking at that decline. Um, versus uh, getting any of the substantive feedback um, that you've heard, some of which Felicia has referenced, uh, and the impact to you know, things like academic, um, school climate, um, student support, for, um, for example. 
So um, switching to the transportation side, um, I'm not, not going to explain the, the map on the right. I think we just really wanted to offer it as an example of how we were analyzing transportation and transportation routes. So we basically looked at five minute increments starting as early as 6 a.m. going all the way to 8.30 in the morning um, in terms of bus routes. And what we were looking for uh, was really opportunities to collapse bus routes. Um, these are commonly referred to as tiers. So certain buses have, um, if you hear it as like a single tier, it basically means they have one route that they run from one time that they start to a time that they end. When you hear two tier or three tier, those, those uh, buses, those single buses, are running multiple routes over the course of a period of time. And so one of the things that we were looking for was, would there be opportunities in which to merge some of these routes to move from a one or two tier to a potentially a three tier that generates the savings um, that we would be looking for in transportation? Um, and we did find some of those savings overall between both Dollarway and Pine Bluff. There's a total of 29 buses that are operated across those school systems um, on a on a day-to-day -day basis during the school year. So this provides um, an example of how the current tiers with two districts would be modified into a possible three-tier system if there were a single district. Now, um, importantly, and again, um, a piece of feedback that we think is important to get from the community is that the bell times would have to change, right? So you would have some schools that would start perhaps a little bit earlier, and some schools that would start perhaps a little bit later, um, which could have impacts, particularly at your secondary levels, on things like extracurricular activities, um, and in thinking about you know, when students are ready and, and able to engage in instruction, uh, when schools return to in-person instruction. So this provides another view of this data, um, and in particular, where we are able to harvest the savings um, is from the routes that are above the number of buses needed across time, essentially. So what you can see in a, in a three-tier model, which is on the right-hand side of this graph, um, we can reduce six buses, essentially, um, in moving to a three-tier model. So what this equates to um, is uh, essentially taking those six bus routes times what we estimate to be about a $40,000 savings in each bus in annual operating costs, that's the cost of the driver, um, additional staff on the bus, any of the maintenance, gas, fuel, um, so on and so forth, that would produce approximately a $240,000 um, annual savings. Um, the implementation of those changes in bell schedules I mentioned before, um, but also getting more accurate estimates on the bus routes themselves. Uh, there are um, software, um, currently Dollar Rate doesn't use this software that basically helps to optimize um, the bus route, right? So we don't think much about right-hand turns, but they are a big deal when it comes to buses, right? I don't have to stop at a stoplight for two or three minutes. And when you add that up over a two and a half to three hour period, that adds a lot of time. Uh, so these kinds of software, which we think would be a necessary investment in getting to optimizing those, that three-tier system, uh, would cost about $50,000, thereby bringing down the savings to about $190,000 uh, across net savings on an annual basis. Um, I just wanted to flash uh, a couple of um, maps here. You can see the kind of population density really consolidated into um, the city of Pine Bluff, but obviously having um, populations that still would need to be picked up by these buses in the formerly Alzheimer Unified School District would add some of those costs, but even having um, seen that would create an opportunity for that $190,000 savings. Um, one other opportunity, we didn't analyze this um, uh, with as much depth as we did looking at the, um, the bus routes themselves, but this provides um, a look at each of the elementary schools that we had mentioned before and the walking distance um, from a radius perspective around each of the schools. So the blue is basically a one mile radius, the green is a two mile radius, and the red is a three mile radius, um, especially for elementary schools in which, um, based on our analysis, they would, they would remain as they currently are. We typically suggest a one to two mile radius, potentially, um, that you could use for upper um, elementary school students for walking distance, and obviously the, the larger that walking distance that you're requiring for those students, the less um, students that would need to be on the bus, thereby potentially achieving some additional savings. So I wanted to offer that as 
um, another piece of analysis that we could potentially go deeper into should the board um, express interest in moving in this direction. So a little bit about the execution strategies uh, for consideration here under annexation. Uh, so which school district um, would be receiving Dollar Way School District um, in this analysis we uh, said was Pine Bluff uh, School District. Uh, the date of annexation uh, would be July 1st of 2021 based on the board's decision. Uh, we estimate about one to two years worth of transition to merge the school district functions. Um, in, turn, in regards to the decision point around how the school board would be structured, um, the state would resume would uh, resume authority if the Pine Bluff um, school district basically, it, or Dollar Way is annexed into Pine Bluff. Um, there would be some limited authority uh, with the board uh, from both Pine Bluff, Dollar Way, and the former um, Alzheimer areas based on the potentially community advisory board that is set up by the state. Uh, in terms of implications for the incentive finding, in, so sorry, the incentive fund millage rates and operational, um, we see here a substantial difference from the reconstitution option in that the availability of both one-time and ongoing revenues is substantial, um, and I think notable in that it eclipses the re reduction in revenue as a result of enrollment um, as compared to a return to local control option or um, a re um, a, a, a reconstitution option, sorry. Um, finally, uh, again, kind of continuing to pull over from those other options, most of those savings we would see realized in the 22-23 school year, um, particularly with the merger of those school campuses that would boost the enrollment. Um, in this option, as well as consolidation, we did not introduce the savings that we think would be achieved with the merger of those school campuses in large part because the analysis really looked at just next school year but if we were pushing it out into multiple years, 22, 23, or 23, 24, we would then potentially be able to recognize those savings when we think that that would become uh, a feasibility. The staffing changes would maintain um, the superintendent, maintain leadership of the Dollar Way schools. Um, we would be collapsing some of those central office positions and some of the reduced staffing potentially on each of the school campuses. The um, DESE and the state would continue to resume or sorry, retain authority over the district um, following the existing timeline and providing that additional technical assistance and capacity building um, into the future. So I'll pause there and take any uh, questions, Madam Chair, from the board. Dr. Hill. Okay. Ms. Newton. You said the millage, millage rates would remain the same. Do Pine Bluff and Dollarway still ha have the same millage right now? Uh, they do not. Um, Pine Bluff currently has a two mil um, addition uh, above the current 25 MNO uh, requirement. Uh, so um, as, I, as we understand it, um, those millage rates would continue along their existing paths for the current Pine Bluff and Dollar Way School District. Um, at the next election, uh, which could be as early as May of next year or November of next year, um, whichever entity um, is then uh, uh, has that authority could make a decision about whether to put that election in front of Dollarway to bring up uh, that millage rate to equate to Pine Bluff. So, so if the, if we annex, then part of the district would have one millage, and the other part would have a different millage, unless the unless Dollar would if the election came about, would Dollarway by itself have to vote for the increase of two meals or would it be controlled by the whole new part? How would that work? Again, this, this is probably a question we'll have to get confirmation on, but okay. this is not unprecedented. Uh, we've seen other um, districts that go through consolidations or annexations where uh, one geographic area that was the former district has a different rate, millage rate, than, than the other. Um, the, I believe that geographic area that has the millage rate has to vote for it. And yes, Courtney is shaking her head. So, so it, is, um, it, it, it is the affected geographic area, even though they may be part of the same district. So that, that difference could continue on? And, and has. We've had situations okay. where that has carried on for a number of years. Okay. Um, my other question is, 
on the, the transportation information that you, you gave us, that's really not going to be part of our decision, is it? Wouldn't that be part of a local, I, if, this, if this were to happen, would those decisions be part of what the local um, leadership would decide? Th th that's correct, yeah. We, we, we simply just wanted to present okay. the possibility of what would happen, happen under an annexation scenario. Okay, and then um, my other question was on the um, uh, state control. Uh, I'm, I'm not clear on what happens if we choose to go annexation because Palm Bluff is, un is under state control. Um, does that continue on the current clock? Does the clock start over? Does the clock stop? Um, what happens with, with that? You would, if you would talk on the mic, please. You can use the mic up there. No, never mind. He said no. No. <coughs> Miss Newton, it would probably continue on the current clock of Pine Bluff because. Dollar Way would be annexed into Pine Bluff. Dollar Way would be annexed into Pine Bluff, so it would become a part of Pine Bluff. So it would continue on the current clock. And how much time is left on, on that? When when is their five years up? I believe they're they have three years left. Does okay. that Stacy? Pardon me? I believe we're in the third year. Yeah. So there would be two years Couple left more after years. this year. Thank you. Ms. Smith, did you have something to add? Okay. Okay. Ms. Newton, um, dang it. Ms. Chambers. Just a, I have another process question, and it's not specific to annexation, but the relationship of it to the other exit criteria. Should we consider each one of these options as a discrete um, decision and what I mean by that is could you decide to reconstitute and then based on some outcome over a period of time decide to go to annexation or that's not the way to think about it it's it you you pick one of these four options Uh, again, that may be a question we'll need to look at and bring back uh, a response at the work session. Uh, I don't know if we could give you an answer for that right now. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mrs. Woods. Dr. Moore? Yes, I have a lot of questions and probably more points of discussion for our work session, but um, first looking at the transportation, I thought that was really interesting, but what I would like to see is analysis of time spent on bus. I don't know if that'd be something y'all would do. Um, from my rough reading of it, well, first I'll preface it by I don't like kids on the bus at 6 a.m. Um, I don't like them on the bus before 7 a.m. In the, in the points that we can do that. I know no one does in an ideal world. Um, but the way I look at it, the all former Alzheimer district sits above the river, and there are two ways to get into Pine Bluff. And so it doesn't look like kids are going to be on the bus for an extended period of time going from Dollar Way High School to Pine Bluff High School. But that would be something I'd want to know because I think that certainly is a factor as we look at um, you know, potential decisions by the districts. Second to that, I don't know how far y'all have digged into the facilities, and I don't know if that's something the department wants to present later. Um, but I think it is important for us to get an understanding of the current state of the facilities, um, particularly the high schools. I know Pine Bluff has some plans. Is it firm plans to build a new high school? Um, or discussions of plans to build a new high school? And I, th I think they have a project filed on their, in their master plan. Okay, I think, um, I, I think having us hear more about that would be certainly very beneficial. And on the question, Ms. Newton, you asked about the wealth index. So we are in a transition uh, on the calculation of wealth index. 
for the current cycle that they're in, the local share um, is just under 50%. It's about half and half, 46% and 54% of state contribution. But in the 23-25 cycle, uh, that is going to change dramatically. And it, it, they won't calculate that until we get into that cycle. Uh, but it's probably going to be somewhere in the um, 70 plus range for state share uh, for, you know, we, we can't calculate for both districts each, uh, to combine, but each district separately would be somewhere in the 70 plus percent. Somewhere around 70 as well. I, sorry, I did think of one more question, if that's okay. Do any campuses have school-based school -based health clinics in Pine Bluff or Dollar Way? Okay. That would be something I'd want us to put on as a point of conversation in our work session to think about, especially with an influx of money in Pine Bluff, um, what that would look like at our campuses in the future. Ms. Warren. Yes. Dollar Way High School did have a, uh, uh, that coordinated health grant, but still continues to operate a, um, a, a center there at the high school, but only that campus. Okay. This is effective. Yes, I think it'd be important on our work day to also hear the differences of the programming at each high school, what each school is offering the students, um, probably pertaining to CTE courses, and just to hear kind of the basic difference between each high school would be great. Thank you. Mr. Sutton. Um, I, I do have some questions uh, that I will probably reserve until the December 1st meeting, but um, to Dr. Moore's point or question about transportation um, and having lived through two district annexations um, when I served on the board in Marion, um, transportation becomes a very big issue. Uh, it might not appear to be that important as you're studying fiscal responsibilities and academics, but transportation, it becomes a real bear. I did notice that um, on one of the screens you mentioned, or it was on there, that the maximum ride time of 100 minutes. I don't know how many students that would affect. That is an awful long time. If that is, by its definition, uh, a student ride time. Board member Sutton, just to respond to that, um, we can, I can go back and get the actual numbers for the number of students, but um, it's, it's at least um, a set of students that would be um, starting on the bus um, for that 100 minutes, so that would be about an hour and 40 minutes, yes. Has there been any thought about, let's suppose that the majority of the students that would, that would be on that ride time, um, is it, was there any consideration about maybe annexing the elementary with a Whitehall or a district that's closer? I understand about not the whole Dollarway system, but the younger kids that are having to board buses 6 a.m. or before, was it looked at to maybe have them go to another district that's closer? So I, I think those are very good detail questions. One thing I want to kind of just remind everyone is the transportation, the actual closing of school buildings or consolidating of buildings, um, the idea of other programs. Those are all like suggestions for painting for a future of what it could be. So West Ed came in as an analysis part and said, look, if you think about annexation or consolidation, or even reconstitution where we're combining transportation, there is an opportunity for money savings. 
their analysis is on the extreme side of to save the most money, here are things that you can do. And so once I think a, a decision is made, those are the conversations then that occur locally with, you know, I agree when, when you point out 100 minutes for that would probably not be something that would sit well and would not be something that locally they would want to do. So um, even though they made that suggestion and gave that presentation, there's still a conversation to be had that there is a money saving opportunity in transportation. We may choose not to go to the far side of that fiscal savings and maybe find a more moderate place, um, but we will pull some of that data for you. Um, Jason's flight, unless you want to see me present the consolidation part, <laughs> Jason's flight is, is not far away. So, um, and I know we used to want to be fed. So Never do you mind ahead. if I just ra get him to no, do ahead. that part? Take, okay. Do what you need to but do. But did that help clarify on the scenarios? Okay, yeah. great. And, and just to say to, uh, before Jason starts that last section, any of these questions that you have now or that you may think of uh, afterwards, please send them to us so we can start working on getting those responses ready for you by that work session. Because I think this, uh, and one of the things that I've, I've thought about and Stacy, we need to look at, we know that over a course of, of time of nearly 20 years or maybe 15 or so since Alzheimer has been consolidated and you look at there, there are probably students that live in that area that have school choice to Des Arc or, or somewhere else that, uh, you know, you probably would want to know that information and that's something that we can get for you as well. So, you know, you won't be thinking that all these kids are going to be uh, on a bus for an hour and 40 minutes. There are other there are other data points that would need to be taken a look at. So we'll, we'll work on getting that information for you too. Thank you. Um, Secretary Key, is this presentation that we've been going over for the last couple of hours, is that available to us to print? Yes, yes sir, uh, Mr. Sutton. It's on the, uh, it's on the agenda uh, posted on the website. Go ahead. I think it was added this week, earlier this week, yeah, it was added earlier this week. But I would be glad to send it directly to Okay, and, and yeah, Stacy said that she can send it directly to everyone as well. Uh, so to move into our uh, fourth of four options around uh, consolidation, um, again, the, the kind of code and rules um, surrounding consolidation do look um, in some part consider uh, similar to, to annexation. However, um, the biggest difference under a consolidation option is that you are essentially creating a new school district. So you are dissolving both of those school systems, bringing them together um, for consolidation. Um, this has implications for the role of the state, uh, in which case you would be establishing a new school district in which you would then have to establish new collections of data to establish how that school district is doing relative to both their academic and financial performance, um, relative to what is uh, laid out both in code and in the rules. Um, in regards to states, um, the state's uh, uh, support, um, either under a level uh, um, type of support for academic or under, under fiscal distress. Um, from the perspective of the, the relevant stakeholder input for consolidation, we had just over half of the stakeholders stating that they really would like to maintain Superintendent Warren's leadership and or the successful improvement strategies that she has led in the Dollar Way School District. Um, this clearly was an important component of the stakeholders' feedback in recognizing Superintendent Warren's leadership and her ability to kind of steward the school district uh, going forward. Uh, we also had seven individuals that acknowledged the potential operational, financial, and or programmatic benefits of consolidation, that bringing those school districts together, if it's from the offerings that potentially are at the high school level, or other opportunities in which to create um, joint uh, training for teachers or for other administrators. Um, several of the stakeholders acknowledged uh, that benefit. And that 60% of the stakeholders expressed concern about the consolidation of Dollar Way, especially as a rural area, uh, with a more urban area of Pine Bluff, citing both cultural differences, travel time of buses, um, specifically were cited uh, in, those, in those comments from stakeholders. 
So some of the key uh, finance and operational findings, again, very similar to uh, our findings around annexation, uh, the decline in annual revenue, uh, the recognition of the one-time incentive funding, the additional revenues that are coming from uh, the casino, and then pausing any of that unnecessary building and repair uh, to, and pursuing that sale of surplus property. So again, um, the summary of revenues and expenditures for both the combination of Dollar Way and Pine Bluff school districts are represented here. Um, a lot of these changes essentially look similar. I think the one representation that I would offer to the board in a circumstance of both annexation um, as compared to consolidation is timing. That annexation, given the, the law and the code, would likely happen much more quickly than in a consolidation option in which you are dissolving both of the systems and bringing them together. So a lot of the representation of savings here would likely fall farther into the fiscal year next year, the 21-22 fiscal year, um, as opposed to annexation, which would likely become uh, savings that could be realized earlier on in, in the fiscal year. So this is just a, a look at those, um, those revenue uh, combinations for both Dollarway and Pine Bluff School District. Again, the expenditure savings that we recognized from both um, the position consolidation at the central office level. Um, and here, um, we represent some of the total position compensation changes uh, that net that $669,000 loss. We also just, for, um, for showing that potential savings of the merger of the high school, we estimate that it would be about a $681,000 savings um, if the two high schools were to come together um, leading into the 22-23 school year. Again, we didn't include this in the summary figures that we showed in the previous slides, but we think as representation for the board um, in considering these options, we thought it was important to, um, to at least put a pin out there in terms of what some of the cost savings might be achieved um, through the merger of the, the high schools. So in terms of some of the execution strategies, um, the the school district that um, would be consolidated with Dollar Way School District, as we mentioned before, would be Pine Bluff. Um, this would begin in earnest, or sorry, legally uh, on July 1st of 2021 with about one to two years of transition. Again, noting that the consolidation uh, efforts would likely take a little bit longer given a lot of those decisions would be within the localities um, purview as opposed to an annexation type of timeline and the circumstances under which Pine Bluff is currently under state control currently and still has two, two and a half years uh, remaining in that, in that timeline. Um, the, the local school board, uh, in terms of its structure and powers, uh, they would have to elect new permanent boards in either the first or second election after the July 1, 2021 decision, so that would be November of next year or the subsequent election in, uh, in 2022, in the 2022 calendar year. Uh, the school board would include representatives, representation from various geographic locations in the county that would include Pine Bluff, Dollar Way, the Alzheimer area, um, based on the way the boundaries are drawn. And the school board would have an ability to make those decisions um, for former Dollar Way schools or former uh, Pine Bluff schools, at least initially. Uh, implications for the finance side, um, is that the state's incentive fund would become triggered for the consolidation option. Um, both school districts in this case would derive that benefit from the newly opened casino and economic activity. Uh, we've talked a bit about the, change, the differences in millage rate and the implications of that, and a little bit about the excess property as well. We've also touched on, again, looking very similar to the annexation option, some of the savings realized in the 22-23 year with a possible merger of those campuses should the, dis should the district in a consolidated option decide to move in that direction. Um, in terms of uh, staffing changes and what would occur, uh, there would be newly formed district leadership at the, at the decision of the school board at that point. Uh, and uh, in regards to the state's role, DESE's role um, could continue to provide some of that technical assistance and capacity building um, that would be offered, but not through any kind of formal, uh, you know, fiscal distress or academic distress as those timelines would start over again um, in July of uh, 2021. So with that, um, Madam Chair, I'll pause there and take any questions you all might have. Okay, Mr. S uh, Lugadu, sorry. Dr. Hill. Ms. Newton. <clears throat> 
and I'm not sure which scenario this would go under and uh, which one it would fit under or may multiple, but I, I would like to see some analysis on what, what would it look like if um, out of the two districts uh, there was a district conversion uh, similar to some, what, some of the charters that we've seen in the last few days where one high school became a career center or something along that lines. Uh, which one of those would it fall under and, and would there be costs that, that we, where we could do that? Okay. Ms. Chambers. No questions. Okay. Ms. Woods. Dr. Moore. Okay. Doc, uh, Mr. Sutton. No. Okay. All right. Uh, use your mic, please. Don't miss Newton. Uh, is that a possibility? What she was talking about, like the School of Innovation or something like that, that that would get, get creative down in the in that rural area to help. Is that? I mean, I know those things up northwest. Is that something to consider? I think it's something that could be considered. I don't know how. Um, I don't think it could be considered as part of the board's action because the statutory processes for either conversion charter or school of innovation are clearly stated um, and spelled out of how that would go and there are timelines especially if it was a conversion charter so uh, while those are, are definitely options that could enhance the uh, opportunities for kids in those uh, in that city um, I, i'm not sure that it's something that really y'all can act on uh, within the, the time frame we're dealing with Well, if there are no further questions, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Okay. Yeah, so, so we have a few slides left, but Jason, I think you're ready for some lunch. Okay, let's do it. No, no, no. I, I want you to finish. I didn't realize it, that, that we had um, slides left. We just have a few let, me yeah. hit, let, me, let me take maybe two minutes no, to sum up. No, go ahead. Up, finish wanna, whatever you need to do. <laughs> I want to turn it over to Mrs. Smith to, okay. to, to close this out. Um, so uh, I think just, again, reminding the board about the, the decision tree um, in making this decision about dollar way. Uh, we are currently at the November 13th meeting. We have a work session that is planned for December 1st. Um, all of your questions, um, you know, at the guidance of uh, Commissioner Key and Mrs. Smith and the rest of the staff um, will be supporting um, and, get, and being prepared for that session on December 1st. Um, also recall that we are um, planning our second phase of engagement. Um, again, incorporating a lot of the questions that you're asking um, for, for the board um, themselves. Um, for your benefit, we also included some of the major themes for both the stakeholder engagement um, in the fiscal and operational analysis. Um, and again, a kind of full summary of some of the um, key points for each of the options for you to review as well. Uh, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Mrs. Smith and she can uh, take us home to the end of the presentation. So I appreciate the West Ed staff, and I know, um, Ms. Dean, you were probably getting ready to say, yeah. say all of that. Yeah. Um, again, just kind of echoing what um, Secretary Key said, all of your questions, anything that, I mean, this is jawed thoughts and opinions. You can email those directly to me. You can send them to Gina. We'll make sure and take those down and make sure we bring all that back to the work session so that you have all the information that you need. Um, as far as today goes, I mean, I will leave it up to you um, and the board to decide if you want to come back after lunch and discuss and mm -hmm. list more stuff, or if you want to wrap it up from here and email, completely at your disposal on that. I think it would be good. It, it's, it's up to the board. I, I don't have an issue with staying to discuss, because I know there are people that had questions, but it's, it's up to the board. Or we can wrap it up, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't have an issue with that at all. Okay. So thank you so much, Mr. Willis. Thank you, Ms. Brown and Ms. Outlaw for joining us today. A very thorough presentation and we thank you so much for your work and um, just the, the professional level that you've done it on. We appreciate it. And this, this will help us exponentially as far as making um, a decision that's best for our kids. So thank you so much. Appreciate you. All right, and with that, we'll we'll break for lunch, and we'll be back. Yeah, one o'clock.
we have a question? Okay. Well, I, mean, I don't mind if we stay. No, I just, I know he has a flight to catch. I texted Stacy and I told okay. Okay, then let's do it. I'm sorry if this is that I wanted to say. 17 minutes, okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I just was want to make sure you got to your flight. Okay. So, yeah, do you guys have some specific questions or comments that you want us to pull together? I did have another um, something maybe for our work session to discuss would be pre-K and early child care options both in Dollar Way and Pine Bluff and what that looks like in the community. Okay. Ms. Smith, the, the, uh, in terms of the timeline, you'll have then the additional feedback from this next phase of engagement, is that right, to bring to that work session? Yes, ma'am. I think that was part of y'all's reasoning when you decided December 1st is because it would be after the stakeholder feedback. Ms. Smith, um, could, at the work session, could you maybe on each one of these give us exactly what our decisions points would be? Because I know we've heard a lot of things that I think, you know, um, we talked about transportation and building closing and different things like that that are really not going to be I don't, I don't feel like those will be our decisions. I feel like those will be local decisions. So could we get exactly what our decision points would be under each one of the different scenarios, what our choices would be? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that comment um, because I think one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we maintained throughout this whole process was we want to paint a vision of what we're moving towards. And so I think, and I appreciate um, Weston because I think they kind of tried to do that. If you, you know, if you choose annexation, these are the things that the district can think about doing and painting towards. And so I agree with that for your role the next time, start thinking about what are the decision points? And then what are those things that we're painting towards that are really local um, decisions? You have any other questions, Mr. Sutton? Okay. All right. I do have Dr. another one. As we look in the state, have more districts been annexed or consolidated? And do we have pro cons from you know? Say the over past history, consol years? consolidation has been the, the most. Um, Why is that? Common. Why? I, th I think it depends on the the trigger that. Right. Um, consolidation, uh, if you're under 350 prior to the law that allows the waiver for 350, uh, that um, the number of, of implications there of, of why you would consolidate or annex. Annex is usually, uh, or, or friendly consolidation is usually when you have two groups that agree. You've also had situations, though, where the department has had to do what we call starburst, okay. um, where a district has been split up between a, a number of surrounding districts because of some of the issues that y'all brought up today, like transportation uh, density, population density. So, uh, you, but consolidation, I would say, is typically the, the more common. Um, and in, but in both cases, you know, annexation and consolidation both qualify for the incentive funding uh, and that's you know so that's a, a consideration that local districts have had as well when they've made that decision at the point that I know um, when Alzheimer previously I think there were a couple districts that went into Alzheimer was Alzheimer annexed into Dollar Way or consolidated Do we know? I think it was consolidated right Mrs. Warren I think any um, and, and, there, and let me back up another reason is when you create a new district with consolidation it um, there are elements of 
how you determine the representation then mm -hmm. for the new district. Uh, so, so there are mechanisms cool at, in, under uh, Act 60 from 2003 that kind of lined out how you would create a new school board in a consolidated district uh, under Act 60. So I'd say that's another reason most of these that we've seen are, are consolidations. Okay, I know um, obviously because of the of, of that point in time with the Alzheimer district, that has really changed the landscape of that rural area. I think any um, literature or information we have on best practices in consolidation or annexes from prior ones would be helpful for us as we're looking. I know there were some studies that were conducted, um, probably nothing much recent, uh, but I'd say between the years of 2003 and 2010, 2013, um, I believe uh, OEP may have done some a analysis of that, but we can go back in the archives and see what we can find. Okay, I mean, I, I know it's a, for some communities it still is a sore spot across the state, and so I think the, the community is where it's where they have overcome it and really seen um, success. I think would be helpful for us to hear from. No, I. I I think that's a good point, and we'll make sure and pull some of that. Um, and I think another piece that's really important about this is, and I just said it a second ago, but it, it's not about that we annex or we consolidate or we constitute and it's done. We really need to create a fluid plan for the districts moving forward that's the next two, four, six, what does it look like in 10 years, and what are they moving towards? Um, and so those are some of those pieces. Again, it may, may not, those decisions may not be made by this board, but those are very important discussions to ensure that it goes well that has to occur shortly after. I'm not sure if I, if I, if I missed it or what, but how would the um, board be made up if we go with annexation? Does it go with the Palm Bluff board or would there be representation zones? How does that work? So I believe in um, the scenarios that was presented here, I think that um, it was that they would, so it would be still under state authority. Um, however, if the state board at some point or Commissioner Key wanted to begin the process of appointing a, a limited authority board, um, you know, as we're moving forward with Pine Bluff and all the way together, I think that's a consideration to, to think about. So at that point where Pine Bluff was being released, then we could consider zones and that sort of thing at that particular time. Okay, yes, ma'am. And I do think there is a, a, a phase in of training. You know, if we, again, thinking about this very intentionally, when, when would we want to start that? And when would we want to try to have that limited authority and, and those pieces? I Mr. think if, if, you, if you go back to the, consol the last segment with the consolidation option, thinking in terms of consolidation means you take two or more separate districts and you make them one new district, then uh, Jason uh, alluded to it, the timeline stop. I mean, you, you're talking because you, you no longer have a district that's in level five support. You have a brand new district that you, you're changing your, um, your LEA numbers. Uh, you basically have a, um, I don't want to say a reset of accountability, but as it relates to uh, the state authority over a district, you you have that to consider as well. Uh, so you know, I'm sure those are all things, and, and those are probably questions that as you think about it, you'll come up with other questions and other details that you'll want us to, to dig into and bring to that work session. I do have one last lingering. So as going way back to the beginning of our conversation, I know it was said that if Delroy continues, there will be some severe fiscal issues. I think if, if West Ed or our, our team could paint a clearer picture of what that would be, what, what, that, what those decisions would have to be for Dollar Way going into the next school year if nothing were to change um, just within their own budget would be helpful. I, 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 can, I think we can answer that today. You're talking about massive reduction of headcount of staffing. That, that is, that when, when you have, a, when district operations, 80% or so, 75 to 80% of the funding is tied up in, uh, in personnel, um, there's, there's very few other places to cut. 
and that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, I know Barbara's sitting there, and she's probably saying, I wish you'd hush, but we just got to be straight. I mean, that's where we are, and what we have done is tried to, we've worked very hard to raise, um, increase salaries, to, to hold people there, you know, to reduce that that outflow of, uh, of, of with the turnover and so there are a number of things that we've tried to do to uh, get the academics solidified and I think we've been successful in that but at the same time you have that balance and so when we think about that question uh, Dr. Moore what are the implications the implications are uh, really some tough decisions with respect to to staffing and it, along those lines, is that central office, is that building, I mean, it's a pretty small district to begin with. Um, and I guess there's no more buildings to be consolidated within the district, correct? The, talking about buildings? Right. I, I think we, I think with what we have done at this point, it's been effective, um, but I, I don't see a lot of room for any additional moving of, of kids into uh, the building or around in the buildings okay. yeah I mean most of the building structures I think earlier in the slides we were showing they were most of them um, had about two to three hundred students in a building so you know when you start thinking about in terms of you know consolidating again additional buildings closing another building I mean those would have to be some real discussions going forward if they were to stay and remain open but you would have to have some substantial cuts in teaching staff okay. any other questions I don't think there are any other questions So on December 1st, um, when we have our working session, we'll make sure, so as we start pulling these reports and pieces together, um, we'll start collecting it and see if we can get some of the things to you ahead of time so that you actually have them to read before we come to the December 1st meeting, if that's appropriate. And then um, on the December 1st, Ms. Warren and anyone from her team that you would like to have um, for, be a part of that conversation, um, we would like Ms. Warren to be a, you know, here to answer questions specific to her district and. Um, just her, her views and thoughts, I think that's a key point, and so we'll make that sure that she is here. As far as any kind of um, public comment or feedback or anything like that, as far as the work session or on the December um, 10th board meeting, is there anything as far as that as guidelines if community is asking that we wanna just, just make sure that it's very public that they know that the first is happening um, and that there'll be the work session if people want to attend and listen to that, but then public comment would be available on the 10th, is that correct? Anything else that you want to make sure that I've covered or questions that you have? And if you think of something between now and then, reach out. We'll try to get it to you, okay? It's a lot of information today. I appreciate your patience. Okay, thank you. That's Again, it. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate yes, thank you. you. We'll make sure you get to your flight. Um, I will nice adjourn. job, Stacy. Yes. Uh, thank you for the, t the team and, and um, West Ed as well. If there's nothing else, we'll be adjourned. Um, and we'll head upstairs to lunch, which is 201A. So we're adjourned. Thank you.